and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 103, Surprisingly Complex Games. Games that were much more than we expected. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We totally should have called this one more than meets the eye. How did we miss that? We missed the Transformers reference. <laughs> totally should have done that. Anyway, tonight we're going to be talking about games that were much more involved than you would have <laughs> expected. Like games that surprised us uh, with their complexity and depth. Um the, basically games that were more of a game than we expected or surprised us in some way. When we get to the game room, I've got a couple of games where what I'm going to be doing is comparing the new version of something to the old. So up first, I'm going to spend some time talking about how Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion differs from the original Gloomhaven, including new components and rule changes. And there are more of them than most people seem to lead you to believe. It's not all just line of sight and focus anymore. Uh, then we're going to move on to a detailed review of Mermaid Adventures Revised. Uh, this is a setting book for the PIP System Core book that we reviewed last week. Um, I'll be talking about my time at Cap Camp Capstone, which was yet another game convention that happened last week, uh, once we get to our week in review segment. And we, I've got a little bit more to say about Jaws of the Lion there. And then Sean and I actually both played an RPG this past week, Runaway Hirelink. So we'll be talking a bit about that. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of online. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere online as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a quick comment from Walk Steady on YouTube on our two year anniversary episode. Just found you. Enjoyed the show. Uh, thanks, Walk Steady. I hope you stick around. Next, longtime fan and patron of the show, Brian Kurtz, commented on our PIP System core book review. <clears throat> This is a great review. Both As both a Pip System mega fan and a Bellhop mega fan, this is like a Reese's peanut butter cup of gaming goodness. I have a great interest in RPGs for young people, and of the ones I have tried, there are five that are standouts to me as truly outstanding. This is one of them. I also think it is quite suitable for adults, and as you point out, is more rules light and story driven than some crunchier systems. Mm. That suits me well. I am planning to run the So Mote It Be setting of PIP with my online group when it comes back to me as a GM. We are roti rotating GMs right now as we are playing Blades in the Dark. My list of top five outstanding RPGs for kids is Amazing Tales, which is so rules light that it is barely a system, but a very good way to flexibly introduce RPG storytelling games. Hero Kids scratches the maps and minis itch. No Thank You Evil, two brilliantly, especially brilliant things about uh, No Thank You Evil, are its mechanics to promote helping support another character's action mm -hmm. and the system to allow differing complexity of rules uh, even in the same game so that a different age skill kid can play together. A Tiny D6 especially the Tiny Dungeon Hatchling <laughs> Edition, and the PIP system. There is no order to this list of five outstanding games because they are each good in their own way for different things. Anyway, great review, and I hope it turns some folks on to the PIP system. Now, Brian must have really liked this review because he also commented on the YouTube version of the RPG review. I always love it when the Bellhop tackles RPGs. Great review of a system I like. I enjoyed the blog post on this, and I had to watch this one on video. Very cool. Well, thanks for the very detailed comments, Brian. Um, 
for me with my girls, once we found Mermaid Adventures, I basically kind of stopped looking for kid-friendly RPGs. Uh, we were having fun with that. So uh, why fix what isn't broken, right? So I never really drove into any of the other RPGs designed for kids. And at this point, my kids are pretty much past those introductory level games. So now that we have the PIP system source book, that's a nice step up from the original Mermaid Adventures rule book. Um, and well, tonight, later in the show, I'll be talking about the revised version of Mermaid Adventures, where Aloy has actually updated Mermaid Adventures to be a setting book for the PIP system source book. And again, that's probably the next step we'll take here. Well, what we'll do is toss links to all those great sounding kids RPGs in the show notes. Now, up next, we got a surprisingly high number of comments on our unboxing videos this week. Mm -hmm. First up, a comment from Chris Groff on our Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion unboxing that just went up earlier this week. Chris says, that's a good amount of bits, but the best thing they did was the map being in the books. Well, thanks for the comment, Chris. Uh, well, I do agree that not having to dig around and look for the right map board and all the overlay tiles is a great change. I do think Jaws has done even better, even more in impressive from it is the much better onboarding system and how much better it is for getting the game to the table quickly in the box. I was teaching rules of the game by bite through the five intro scenario. Now, more about that and Jaws of the Lion later in the show. Next, the Grack commented on our Burning Suns unboxing. It seems it has good components. Do you actually play it? How is it? Well, Grack, um, sad to say I haven't had a chance to actually play this due to the pandemic. Uh, this is a big, epic 4X sci-fi game, uh, you know, trying to compete with games like Eclipse and Twilight Imperium, and those just don't play well with two players. And this one in particular is rather high up on the complexity scale. This is a very involved 4X that's trying to uh, get all of the X's as well as deal with politics and other things. This is a heavier one. This just doesn't seem like a game that is at a level my kids are going to enjoy. They might be able to get it, but you know what? I'd rather teach them some simpler games and kind of step up to this one. So until the pandemic's done and maybe Sean can come down or we can expand our um, cohorts or whatever we're calling them now to slightly larger groups, that one's unfortunately going to have to sit on the pile of shame until we can get more players to physically play it. And I don't think that one's implemented online. I would be shocked and amazed, actually, if someone had implemented that one online. It is definitely not a well-known game. Yeah. Well, finally, we go over to our Talisman Batman Super Villains Edition unboxing. Gregory Cook says, I recently got this via trade for another game, and it was sealed. I can't wait to crack it open soon. Isaac Kwu basically gave us a play-by-play -play as he watched the video. <laughs> I will call it... Tell us Batman, and no one can stop me. What a beautiful board. It looks like you might be able to repurpose the board for a Silent Hill-inspired game. Yeah. I can't help but wonder if an item you can pick up is a cunning hat to give you a cunning boost. Love the character card artwork. Work. Mm -hmm. Nice miniatures, too. Ooh. <laughs> the loot bag can either carry four normal items or one loot. Space for DLC. All right, for both Gregory and Zick, thanks for the comments. Um, I do got to say, if you are a Talisman fan at all, uh, we'll get to our full review during the review of Palooza next week, but this is a version you really should check out. Like, besides the great Batman theme, I got to admit, the villain theme, trying to escape Arkham, and the, as Isaac noted, top-notch components, like great-looking artwork, great-looking minis. This is a version of Talisman you can finish in about two hours, and that's with four players. I'll admit, I haven't played with six. But with four players, we finished in an hour and a half. That's crazy for Talisman. To me, that alone puts it ahead of the original as far as chances to actually get it to the table for me. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. This is, in, this is that point where we like to say, like, subscribe, hit the bell, and all that stuff. The channel has seen some real growth lately, so please help us continue that. The advantages we would see if we reached partner level go far beyond what just a simple monetization. 
And I got to tell you, for all of you who have suddenly subscribed to us on YouTube, welcome. I don't know where we're getting all this awesome new traffic. Like if 500 was a plateau that we didn't know was a plateau on YouTube, but our number of subscribers there is, have been growing substantially. And that is awesome to see. Greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, assuming Mailer Light actually works, I will be sending out an email recapping all the content we released the week previous. Uh, links to blog posts, new podcast episodes, unboxing videos, and anything else we create. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribe right there in the sidebar, or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. For everyone here live in our chat room tonight, you have one week left, seven days to enter our Gorinto giveaway. Now, for those of you listening on the podcast, assuming you're listening the day it drops, which of course you do, you uh, today is the last day to enter. So head over to the blog right away. So head over to tabletopbellhop.com where we've got the giveaway pinned to the top of the page so you can't miss it. Now, this one in particular, I just kind of want to shout it out because we have lower than expected number of entries on this one. To, to be honest, it's lower than both the Alpha, our Alpha and Dead Man's Cabal giveaway, which kind of shocks me. Not that they're terrible games, but it's just a shame because Grinto is such a great game. Like, I honestly think these this is one of those abstract strategy games that, that like, everyone's going to like near universe. Deal. there'll be people out there that absolutely hate abstracts and this probably isn't going to change your mind but if you're open to anything like that like this could be the next segul i just combined the two together azul or sagrada if you combine the two you get segul now i have to design segul it's <laughs> uh, they already did stained glass in, in azul mm -hmm. anyway though I, I like this is could be the next big hot tile game and i actually think it should be because right now i would rather sit down and play a game of grinto than azul or sagrada or sagul well get those entries in before time runs out now finally just a reminder that we're doing something different for next week's show in place of our regular monthly ama we're going to host our first ever review a palooza all right, this is going to be a review-filled episode. We're not going to have an Ask the Bellhop segment. We're not going to be answering your questions. Instead, try to power through a bunch of reviews. Um, I'm going to share my opinion on up to six different games. Uh, some of the ones we'll be featuring are Roll for Lasers, which is currently on Kickstarter. And we're checking out just because the, the price point is ridiculous. You get the print and play for a buck or two bucks for a physical copy. Uh, before shipping uh, runaway hirelings which is an rpg we'll be talking about later brand da break dancing meeple which is a game that uh daniel on everyday board games wished he had invented and uh well talisman batman which we were just talking about a few minutes ago when looking at our viewer feedback and possibly a couple more if i can get them played before then all right well, we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room the lobby if you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content than otherwise only our patrons get. All right, not a lot going in chat tonight. We were talking a bit about tacos earlier, and we're talking about Spotify and what's going on with um, Google Music going away and how that's going to impact everything. But not a lot of gaming discussion, so I think we're probably going to gonna skip past this and get into the next uh, next segment pretty quickly tonight. So tonight, we are back to providing you with some game recommendations. So specifically, this week, we are looking at games that surprise Sean or I in some way by being much more than we expected them to be. And as we do for all of these game recommendation style episodes, we will be looking back to the lobby or chat room to point out any games we missed or games they know about that we don't. And we will be checking in later in the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions is to come through that website. That way they get logged and tracked and end up on a nice Excel spreadsheet for me to look at. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere online. Well, this week we have a question from a longtime fan of our show with us since the beginning, Prayerborn, who wrote in to say, I've actually thought before that an interesting discussion topic would be surprisingly advanced games. Mm -hmm. Older games with mechanics we think of as recent inventions, or even newer games that are gamier than we expect. Mass-marketed Hunger Games District 12 is a Euro? 
All right. Thanks for the topic, Prayerborn. Uh, I, I feel bad. We've had this one on the pile for a while, but we're finally getting to it. We did get to it. I do apologize. It might have taken a little while. Uh, this is an interesting one, and it's definitely something I have experienced, right? You sit down to play a game expecting one thing and end up with something completely different, right? Now, sometimes the thing that's different is the game's worse than you expected, or it does or which which doesn't seem as common or like it just does something totally new that you never expected to see before or it just is is heavier it just it's much more than you thought it would be whether it's just more fun it does some cool new thing or it uses things you've seen before in new ways or it has more interactions or more options than expected basically more as prayerborn word it more gamier it's it's more of a gamer's game than you would have ever thought it could be now, this happens to me most often probably with mass market games or licensed board games, because for many, many years, if there was a licensed game, it was a license thrown on a terrible, probably roll and move, miss a turn or trivia game. Uh, that's thankfully changing. But I've also had hobby games where they've completely blown me away as well. And while I can certainly think of many, many negative examples to this topic, there are definitely some standout games that have made me do a double take. Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be looking at the positive side of things. We're not looking at games that were disappointing to us. We're looking for we're looking at stuff that surprised us in a good way. Now I gotta say, what happens for here is sometimes I'll find this on my own, right? Like I, I do a lot of research before purchasing a game, or even before like asking for a review copy from uh, publishers, and I tend to not get games that I don't expect to like. So it, every now and then it happens where, where something's different than I expect it to be. But more often, it's hype, right? It's the buzz. It's the, it's the internet hype. It's the pod, podcatchers, uh, Tom Vassell, the, the YouTubers, the content creators like us who will point out a game that most people will overlook. Like a good example of this is, uh, look, like Prayerborn said, Hunger Games District 12 is a Euro? Like seriously, there's a Hunger Games game out there that that's a euro game like not not an ameritrash not a dice chucker like serious i would have never looked at a hunger games game now i'll have to admit i haven't checked this one out but i'm curious now to see how how good this game is yeah young adult uh mass market dystopian fiction isn't exactly where one would expect to mine for deep and thoughtful content in general let alone in the board yeah. game aftermarket <laughs> yeah it's true enough like there, there were so many bad mass market games but anyway, we're, we're going to talk about positive things here. So on, on to the list. So these are all games that surprised us in some way. Um, uh, Prayerborn specifically said more complicated. These aren't all necessarily more complicated, but just that we're more or better than we expected. And I'm going to start off with one that, that just because when I was uh, working on the show notes, I was thinking about that hype, right? That internet hype, the, the buzz. And one of the games that I would have never touched is Medium. And the only reason I dug into that is that was considered the game of Gen Con 2019. Now, I didn't intend Gen Con 2019, but after Gen Con 2019, everyone was talking about Medium. Like, Twitter was a buzz with Medium. The podcasts I listened to were a buzz. Like, oh, did you play Medium? Oh, we played Medium. And oh, at After Hours, we played Medium. Everyone was talking about Medium. So I actually went myself and contacted the publishers and said, I have heard such good things about this game. It would be awesome if you could do a re if, if you would send us a review copy. And I'd also like to do a giveaway because, well, the hype was huge. And we got it. And I'm like, what the heck is this? Like, like I'm going to throw a card down and you're going to throw a card down and we're going to try to say the word in between. And this is supposed to be fun. And then we played it the first time. And the amount, like this was Telestration's level of laughter happening that first time with my Monday night group of uh, generally Euro players, right? Like, like I, I don't know if I'd call them hardcore gamers, but definitely like experienced gamers laughing our butts off with this silly game where we're just trying to say the same word together. So that is definitely my, my, my number one on the list. These aren't in any particular order, but that was one that was a complete surprise. Yeah, no, Medium was 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 definitely that that for me. Um, I had sort of went, yeah, yeah, that'll be amusing. Uh, and then the first time, uh, D and I actually yep. uh, sat down and 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 I put two cards down, and words left her brain, uh, yep. <laughs> and and there was, she was unable to speak, uh, mm -hmm. just because it was that, and it was just that sort of thing, and and the laughter just just kept going. So uh, so that was Medium. All right, next um, goes to the Windsor Comic Con 
where we were there with uh, the CG Realm, a local game store, and we were there to promote our Extra Life event and try to raise some money. And as part of it, Jeremy, the owner of the store, had donated this new game that he swore was going to be hot. And it was a game from the Funko Pop people with little Funko Pops in it. And it was the Harry Potter version. And I've said this before on the show. I am not a Potterhead. That's something that came out after, long after I, well, I still read books. But, like, I wasn't reading young adult fiction, that's for sure. Um, something my kids love. So I have no, and, and Pops never did anything for me. Although I have seen some cool ones, like the Gelatinous Cube one. So I was like, what the heck's this game? Why are people going to care that much? And, and I just figured people would care because it's Harry Potter and Pops. So at that event, Jeff, uh, Jeff Seuss, fan of the show, patron of the show, and I were there doing demos and we sat down and I flipped through the rule book and I read how to do this. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is like, this is like, a, a, I don't know, a Warhammer game. Like this is a miniature skirmish battle game with relatively complex rules. Like that you have different movement points and everyone it's asymmetric. Everyone's unique and they have different spells and the spells have different cooldown values and there's different scenarios. So you can play King of the Hill or you can play capture the flag or you can play like a football like game. I was blown away by how good a game this was, which seems like other people have figured this out too. Like this is one where I got home and scrapped everything we were going to talk about on the podcast the next week and scrapped what review I was going to write to write about this game because I felt gamers needed to know that there was a game here. I, the, 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 all of, like, I only played the Harry Potter one, but they're all compatible. They all use the same rules. This is literally a miniature war game, a skirmish, skirmish war game. Carol Hall, the designers, have confirmed it was actually made by hardcore skirmish war gamers, sat down and went, how can we make an intro-level war game? that'll that fits with the pop theme of just fun yeah no i i still haven't gotten a funko uh onto the table and again i never i never got the funko pop mystique yeah. there it, i don't understand how there are however many thousand different pops and why people collect them like candy but i mean they're obviously a thing and then to all of a sudden have this become a game um now again because it of of who Funko's gaming department is we we sort of understand that a little better you know now now but uh at the time it was a complete shock to yeah, see it baffling yeah and that was the Funkoverse games all right up next is hamster roll this is one of probably my favorite all-time favorite dexterity games that and pitch car fight back and forth but you know what i get hamster roll to the table more often so based on the bellhops law it has to beat out pitch car in that and what it is hamster rolls this big wooden hamster wheel with slats on it and you're stacking blocks on it and it's a it's a dexterity game right and when you see it you're like yeah hey, this is a fun dexterity game but what blows me away about this game is the fact that there is a lot of tactics and possibly even some strategy like planning multiple moves ahead and picking which blocks to place where to put them and then there's that the the evolution of gameplay where you realize another part of the game is looking what the next player has to place. So you look at what pieces your opponents have left and then try to make your placement make theirs more difficult. Having all that in a simple stacking game blows me away. Yeah, no, absolutely. Hamster Roll is one of, if not my, you know, one of my top favorite dexterity games. Uh, and especially because where you play it matters just as yeah. much as who you play it with or, or anything else. The actual surface that you're playing on becomes a part of the game, mm -hmm. um, for better or worse, depending on uh, what kind of a table you're on. Uh, and that was Hamster Roll. Uh, now, up, up next, we've got Go Cuckoo. Mm -hmm. And this is one that really jumped out of nowhere at us. It was uh, mm -hmm. Mo and D at Origins. Uh, and who was it who, who kind of was demanding that you try this uh, silly game pa patron of the show wayne the star wars guy Humphrey. there we go wait wait so wayne Humphrey had this game that everyone had to try and everyone had to try and and really you open it up and it the your first thought is you're actually going to get me to play pickup sticks i mean yep. really come on because that's what they are they are literally just pickup sticks but then you realize no no the container the whole the the, the, the container of the game is part of the game and you start experimenting and the first time you play it it's like oh this is silly and then you realize oh or, you know someone will do something you haven't seen done before and you your brain opens up to more possibilities mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you've gone from a simple game where you're just trying to lean sticks against each other and balance an egg on it to 
evolving this giant mesh of sticks extending far out from the actual, you know, small little container in the middle uh, and, and, you know, testing your knowledge of physics and balance yes. uh, in, in a massive, you know, hard thinking game with swearing and cursing and, 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 you know, people throwing tantrums because, you know, something rolled a little bit too far as they gently put their egg down and there was sweat on their fingers it is amazing. And uh, that was Go Cuckoo, a game released for Haba by Haba for kids for Easter about what 2016 or 2017. This isn't a new one. Yep. All right. One that surprised me. Now, this is another one. Uh, podcasters got me hyped about this. Everyone was talking about this game, and I probably would have completely skipped over it. Uh, that is Ravensburgers Horrified. I hate to admit it. I've admitted already I haven't seen Jaws. I This is just proof of it. I, I am not a horror fan. Even old school black and white classic. I have not seen a single movie that is featured in the game Horrified. I've not seen Dracula or Frankenstein and his Bride or the creature from the, the black, the whatever colored lagoon, from the lagoon, whatever color it is, or the Invisible Man. I've never seen any of those. The, the universal monsters were not something I grew up with. But, so I didn't care about this game. Plus, it just it, it's a mass market it's got miniatures that kind of look like plastic army men they're not all that detailed just didn't do anything for me but everyone was going on about how this game's so good and the one comment that is better than pandemic i kept hearing better than pandemic better co-op than pandemic and longtime fans of the show know i'm not a big fan of pandemic but i do dig good co-op games and i'm always looking for the better than pandemic that i can break out when i roast a game night and people are like can we please play pandemic and i'm like i gotta find anything else i can suggest because i am not a fan of pandemic and there we have horrified which is an amazing game it's actually a co-op pickup and deliver game which you probably wouldn't realize until you played it a couple times that's got completely different styles of play depending on which monsters you face and it's scalable like if you want to play with your kids just throw one monster down if you want to challenge yourself throw down four or five we've never beaten five four no oh, once out of all the times we've tried uh this is a game uh because of all the different things going on and the fact that characters have different powers and different cards you don't get the quarterbacking as much as you do in games like pandemic it can happen but we found it's not that much. I, I am a huge fan of this game. This is one that I got a review copy, um, and I expected to review it, go, yeah, okay, it's neat. It's it's a bit better than Pandemic and pass it on, and I plan on keeping this one. Yeah, no, it was interesting because I remember the unboxing, uh, and it was, you know, great quality, and we were really impressed by, you know, well, this is the stuff that's coming out. Uh, even the way that one page was, there was a one page presented right on the top of the, the, oh, the yeah. label on the back of the, the board, that was presented mm -hmm. as you open the box. They really did a great job presenting it. And it, it felt a lot like it was going to be that sort of flash in the pan. Look, this is this looks fantastic. It looked great on the table, and then we're never going to play it again. And then we sat down and started playing yeah. it. And, and it, was, it was great. And the only concern I really have about that game is the potential for quarterbacking. Yeah. But other than that, and, you know, as long as you've got a good group who are willing to cooperate and, and, and not you know, be overbearing in that way. It is a fantastic game. And that was horrified. All right. This is another surprise one. This is a complete surprise. King me. I uh, got this one from Ravensburger, uh, basically on a whim. The uh, Ravensburg, we had a problem with one of Ravensburg's products. I wrote and complained about this product and in return for uh, not being able to fix the problem I had, they sent us some free games. So thumbs up on, um, like customer support there, Ravensburger, you did awesome. This wasn't a review thing. And what it was is I basically, they said we could pick, like you can get a number of games. And I started going through their catalog and I own most of the good ones, right? And I'm like, huh, I don't know. And I'm looking through and I'm like, I don't know, how about King Me, right? So we kind of picked it randomly. And I looked at it, I'm like, what, like, what is this? Is it, it's, it's supposed to have improved checkers. Like, come on, it's tried and true checkers. What are you going to do with this? And then it showed up and I did an unboxing video with my daughter, which was kind of fun. And I started seeing it and I'm like, whoa, this board's like broken into all different areas. And then we looked at the cards and I sat down and read the rules. And I'm like, wow, they turned checkers into an area majority game where having your parts, your, your, 
I, checkers, I guess, in different parts of the board at different times of the game are going to score you points. That's brilliant. And then added to that, they had a really interesting rule for kinging and how much kings are points. I'm like, this game, seriously, like, like, this is a game, but just still because of the pandemic. But I want to play Char. Like, this is on that, that chess level, I think you could get there in this game. Like, th- this is something that, like, anyone who likes checkers, if you're a fan, has to play this because this really does improve checkers. And even if you're not, this is so much cooler than checkers. Just by having to get your pieces in the right spot at the right time, and you also get points for capturing your opponents, and you also get points for kinging. Really solid game. Like, this one, like, completely out of nowhere. I, I thought we were getting some cheap checkers knocked off, and we, instead we got an awesome evolution of checkers. Well, that was King Me. All right, Camel Up is my next one. And yes, Camel Up, not Camel Cup, though I think in the new edition they kind of made it so it's easier to read. Uh, a dice-based racing game with silly-looking camel meeples that supposedly can stack on top of each other. What, what, that that doesn't seem that cool to me. This is one I literally did not care until playing it at a game night with, I think it plays up to 10 people. It's eight or 10 people. It's a big group. So it's either eight or 10 people, whatever it was. And my God, everyone had so much fun, like laughing and challenging. Like there's two things that, that make this a killer app. That's this game. Um, first off is the fact that it's a racing game where you don't own a camel. So it's not a racing game where you're trying to get your camel to win. You're basically betting on which camel is going to come in first, and which camel is going to come in last, as well as which camel is going to be ahead every round. And that every round bet is, is brilliant because it keeps you interested the whole race. And then there's the whole camel up part where when the meeples move on top of each other and the bottom one moves, they all move with it. That like the, the trying to figure out the odds in that game blows my brain. And I've done it where I sat there going, okay, it's a die three. If you roll a three, you're going to go there. But if you pull the blue die, this one's going to go out. Like it's just so much going on in that game, probability wise that affects those bets. So it is a fantastic game. I was blown away by this. That was one of those games where I played it at that game night at the game store and bought a copy before leaving. Cause I'm like, I got to bring this home. Yeah. That was camel up. Uh, I, I've played that one at the party, uh, a couple of parties and uh, you know, it's just an enjoyable group game. You can all sort of, you know, have a, you know, stand around while, uh, while you're having a drink and, uh, and play. Now, next up we have build Microsoft or mine. Wow. Microsoft, <laughs> Minecraft builders and biomes, which and Minecraft is technically owned by Microsoft. There uh, you go. Now, especially when compared to the card game that I had originally had, which is a Minecraft branded card game, and was absolutely horrific. Uh, it didn't even get the basic Minecraft facts right, um, as well as just being a really boring card game. Now. We got this game, and we weren't sure what to expect, but it was one of those things. You know, I'm a big Minecraft fan. My family's a big Minecraft fan. So I actually reached out to uh, the people at Mojang, uh, and they gave us a contact uh, and and uh, got Ravensburger involved, and that's what got us the, the review copy. And we did the unboxing, and it was interesting, but nothing really outstanding, I think, with the, with the when it came to the unboxing. You know, a bunch of cards. Some boards. The cubes were nice. The cubes, the, the cubes were very nice. The yeah. yeah, they're the, the Teotihuacan sort of uh, side, or not Teotihuacan, um, um, Imhotep. Imhotep uh, cubes. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, and then we sat down and we played the game and realized, oh, wait, there's, there's, there's some depth here. And then we played the uh-huh. game again and went, wow, this is not an easy game. Um, and while it's, it really was easy for my kids to sit down and start playing it. Um, there are very different levels you can play the game on uh, and the, the depth of thinking involved to really play the game well mm-hmm. just pushes it into that next level where it is not just a simple, oh, look, let's build something in Minecraft. No, no, you have to plan for the, you know, you're scoring over three rounds yeah. to really maximize uh, to do. And it's great because you have to also have to make sure you're trying to stop other people you know, oh, look, they're building this, so you need to make sure, if you can, to score one of that, you know, score score the one that they're going to need to triple their score sort of thing. Yeah, there aren't many games that are that strategic, like that you're planning the end game out on your first turn. Yeah. It, it's crazy. And, and like Sean said, simple mechanics. Like, mechanically, dead simple game. What you'd expect from a Minecraft game. But strategy-wise, wow. That was Mind Builder and Biomes. 
Um, you can tell we're just like Ravensburger has put out a lot of good games because we've got another one here, and we're gonna we're gonna have a little shout out at the end, I think, because of this. And that is Jaws. This is one um, we just reviewed a couple weeks ago. This is another case of a licensed game I expected to not be good, as they have not been for years. I am certain there's probably a Jaws Wolin move out there. Um, this is a very neat one versus many board game. And it's got elements from like Spectre Ops or um, Scotland Yard being the more classic game of one person trying to hide while everyone else is trying to catch them. And then a second part, which is this dramatic battle between the shark and the, the uh, a crew of the boat, uh, recreates some key scenes from the movie, or at least so I'm told, because again, I haven't seen the movie, um, has some really solid hidden movement rules, especially with the shark having... Um, four abilities they can use that kind of kind of hide their trail it's just really solid game i'm not going to go into detail because we just covered this one recently but i was extremely impressed by how much more of a game this was than i thought it would be for a movie tie-in uh interestingly i didn't find a rolling move but there is a 1975 um sort of uh, taking things from a shark's mouth with a giant oh, molded geez. plastic shark and waiting for the shark to snap snap down on your fingers sort of okay. thing dexterity game uh and that is that that one would be uh would, is jaws from 1975 but this is jaws from 2018 18 or 19 uh, I didn't yeah no, I, sorry i should have I, i'm confusing uh, things now. the modern 2019 jaws. so it's 20 the, the 2019 ravensburger jaws uh again is is a much more deep and uh, really again it's two board games in one on top yeah. of everything else. So that was Jaws 2019 from Ravensburger. Uh, next, Quirkle. Uh, this is one of those mass market games that you can find anywhere. Like you can walk into, well, I guess in the States, there's no more Toys R Us. I don't know what the equivalent toy store is in the States anymore. You walk into a Target or a Walmart and see this game sitting next to all the other games like Trouble and Sorry and stuff like that and probably quickly overlook it. But it is so good. This is basically Scrabble with shapes where instead of having to form rule words you're matching either the shapes or sorry not matching the opposite you're you're making rows of all the same color or all the same shape and or all different like one thing has to match either the shape or the color in your row and not both because that would duplicate and you can't make duplicates and if you can get i think it's a set of six played out quirkle it's worth extra points scoring is pretty much that scrabble scoring where you score your row plus anything it's connected to i this game is the game that I break out when family members come over or when I talk to people playing board games like, oh, I don't really like hobby board games or I, I don't like complex games like Catan. That's when I'll break out a game like Quirkle. And that was Quirkle. <laughs> Next, I have a game I had never heard of uh, called Zentico. I had to throw this on the list because I was by Zentico company that makes the game Zentico, and I don't have a designer's name. It says it's designed by Zentico. Maybe that's the last name. Uh, they contacted me on Instagram, and this was one of the first games I ever reviewed as the Tabletop Bellhop. And at the time, I was just like, whoa, someone found me. They like us. They're sending us a game. That's cool. So I signed up for it. And then when it showed up, I looked at it, and I'm like, what the heck? This is basically like Nine Men's Morris, right? Like, it's you're, you're trying to make a, a row on a grid, and you can slide pieces one spot, right? And at first, our first play, I'm like, yeah, it's it's okay. It's it's Connect 4 meets Nine Men's Morris. That was with two players. But then, once we played three player, this game became brilliant. This game is so good three player. It is an excellent three player experience. Combined with the fact that the production on this is top notch. This is in a uh, whatever PU leather. It's a type of fake leather. So it's in a PU leather case that rolls up and very portable and this is what i consider now the beach game this is the game i bring out when my kids are going to a splash pad because nothing in this game can get ruined it can be dropped in the mud it can get soaking wet it starts raining it's fine and it is a solid experience now two player it's it's okay uh like i i guess it's a step up from tic-tac-toe but it's not as good as say playing checkers or chess it's okay uh you can get to a point where um you just keep doing the same move back and forth and no one wins. The game goes on too long, but three player, it is so hard to not make a move that gives someone else the win. And that's where it really shines. Right. Well, that is Zentico. 
Now, next up, we have the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. It's a simple family deck building game, uh, but with a ramped up difficulty system that goes from absolute beginner to, oh my God, in about five <laughs> rounds and only keeps scaling up. Uh, so far, we haven't seen the potions uh, expansion, but uh, we know that the monsters, uh, uh, the monsters book of monsters is um, crazy. I mean, it, again, we, mm -hmm. we, we beat the first one on, on Monster Book of Monsters so far, but we still haven't uh, managed to break through the second one yet. Um, and again, you know, it's a co-op, so it should be difficult. You don't, you don't want to be always mm -hmm. succeeding. Um, but the way it takes you through and, and, and builds you up, adding components and adding aspects to the game uh, with each chapter of the book, essentially, is really a fantastic mechanic uh, that allowed me to bring my my kids, you know, from ever having played anything deck builder at all, to being comfortable playing a pretty heavy, you know, reasonably yeah. heavy heavy deck builder without any problem at all. So, uh, yeah, this one blew me away because it was a good Harry Potter game. Because before that, anything I tried is like we we bought like the Golden Snitch card game, which makes as much sense as Quidditch because you play, but then whoever plays the Snitch wins. We're like, kind of, why are we playing this game if it just we could just shuffle and whoever gets the snitch wins and get the same result? Um, and some of the like you would talked about Harry Potter Clue before oh. and just how terrible that is. Yeah. So like, I really wasn't expecting much from this. And I gotta admit, like, I'm I'm kind of bashing on here, but again, this is from the op, and they were not known for good, nice, heavy, detailed deck builder style games. They were known for making versions of Monopoly and some theme games that at the time weren't so hot. So like the fact you were the one that discovered this one i probably wouldn't have touched this until you showed it to us yeah. and it would also blew me away about this is my daughter taught me how to play i have never read the rule book for harry potter hogwarts battle and it's just awesome that my kid taught me to play a game yep absolutely and that was harry potter hogwarts battle all right king domino is my next one this is another game i would have overlooked i it, it's a it's a hobby game based on dominoes with a fantasy theme eh, that that no reason i need to pick this up but i started to hear positive reviews again uh, podcasters talking about it youtube content creators going on about how good this game is and i still wasn't quite sold on it but we were at an extra life event this goes back a few years we were at brimstone games one of the local game stores here in windsor and just trying to kill time. It was like early Sunday morning or early Saturday morning. I, I remember being fairly out of it, whatever day it was. It must have been early Sunday morning. And grabbing a demo copy of this that they had on their shelves. So I'm like, oh, I heard this is easy. And podcasters are talking about it. And Deanna and I sat down and we played the first round. And we're like, wow, that, that's kind of neat. I kind of like that. Like besides the, how are you, oh, then the, the drafting tiles and the order you go in. All right, let's play again. And we played again, and then I'm like, oh, wait, the crowns, the crowns are huge. Like, man, I'm just, I'm going to graft all crowns. And then I played the third round, and I'm like, wait, wait, you're drafting that. If you're drafting that, I'm going to draft this. And you get to that evolution of any drafting game, right, where you go from the worrying about your own stuff to worrying about your opponent's stuff. And then that whole, do I grab something that's good for me but bad for them? We After that third round, I walked over to the shelf, grabbed a copy of King Domino, walked over to the checkout, put their demo copy back, and then opened my shiny new copy and played a fourth round. I am a huge fan of King Domino. Like, if you want a lightning quick, like, five to ten minute game that really does require tactics and strategy, there, there almost is nothing better. And that was King Domino, which reminds me, we need to get another game of that up on uh, Board Game Arena. Yeah, we could at some point. Maybe we should maybe do a night of uh, King Domino with uh, John. <laughs> yeah, you might be interested in that. All right, this is going to be a shocking one to some people because my next one is going to be a version of Risk. Uh, Risk Star Wars Edition. Uh, if you can find it, this one was dirt cheap for a while. It's a little hard to find now. There is a Black Edition, which I personally think is worth picking up. The Star Wars Risk Black Edition, if not original. And what you expect when you see this box is risk, right? Like, except with a new map. And that is so not what this game is. This is actually a remake and retheme of Queen's Gambit, which is a classic, very well-regarded, uh, worth a fortune Star Wars game that came out when episode one hit the theaters. 
this is a modern version of that. And no, not quite as well regarded as the original, but still very positive because what's happening here is it's a card game where on every card you're going to get to do two things. But the thing is there are three battles happening at once. And this is set in the Jedi era. There's the space battle up above Endor with the Death Star and the Millennium Falcon and the Calamari cruisers and all the X-Wings and everything battling it out. And I got to admit that part's very risk-like with rolling D6s to see if you blow up other ships. But then there's also the Han and his team with Leia and Chewie trying to blow up the shield generator on Endor with the uh, other player playing the Stormtroopers. And then you also have Luke having a lightsaber battle with Darth Vader in front of the Emperor. And that is more of a push and pull track. So, you know, you're, you start, the con starts in the middle, but if you play a plus two for Luke, it moves one way and then it moves the other. And you're doing, you're fighting on three fronts at once, but you can only ever affect two fronts at a time. And you get a hand of five cards and there's predicting what your opponent's doing. Like for a game with the word risk on the cover, it just amazing. Now I'll admit it's not the best game in the world. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm not trying to oversell it. It's not the next Twilight Imperium. It's not Star Wars. Um, what's the big Star Star Wars Battalion or Battle? What's I can't remember the big Star Wars game that everyone Battle loves. Battlefleet. Battle. That doesn't sound right either. What is the big Star Wars Rebellion? That's it. Star Wars Rebellion, the big Star Wars in a box game. You're not getting that. This is still a lighter game. This is one I can play with my kids. It's still mass market Hasbro, but compared to pretty much every other edition of risk ever made this blows it away all right well that was star wars risk edition now is there a what is the difference between the star wars risk edition and the star wars a risk star wars edition and risk star wars original trilogy edition do you know the original trilogy edition is risk with oh a it's just map. risk okay it's it's a variant of risk of right so we are looking for risk let me call it star wars edition star wars edition <laughs> Yes, I know. And and there's also Star Wars, the Clone Wars Risk, and there's others. This is Risk colon Star Wars Edition, which is in a red box, and there is the Black Edition, which is, it's got better card quality. You actually get a miniature for the Millennium Falcon and the Death Star. It's, it's, it, it's just quality improvements, a really nice box insert, which is something you don't expect from Hasbro. The Black Edition, if you can find it, is definitely worth it. That's what I own. Right. And that was and Risk, Star Wars. Sorry. Risk Star Wars Edition. <laughs> Sticking with mass market games, we have Blockus. Uh, this is another one you're going to find on the shelf next to games like Don't Step on It and Pimple Pete. Um, this is a puzzle game where you're using polyominoes to fill in a grid. And the brilliant part in this is the way, the shape of the tiles, the number of tiles you get, how many tiles will fit on the board, and the fact that when you place, you at the pace so your tiles only touch diagonally which lets your opponent sneak in on the other corners, basically. This is, uh, you're trying to play all of your tiles before any of your opponents. This game is way deeper than you would ever think. Like, this is a tactical, strategic game. You're counting pieces. You're, uh, you're backstabbing your partners. You're, you're cutting people off. Like, Blockus, to me, is up there with games like the Duke and chess and like i i love this game this is something playing two players you be, be, the, the only disadvantage i would say is two player you play two colors which is okay three players there's a fake third fourth player which is kind of weird where every turn someone has to put it but if you can get a four player game of block is going it is fantastic all right well that was Blockus. now next up ticket to ride new york neither of us are really fans of ticket to ride Yet, however, despite that, this short, succinct version ended up being a really solid, especially two-player game. But it does work up to four players, and it's just enough to scratch that train game itch, but it doesn't overstay its welcome. Uh, I mean, it's, I think the first time we sat down to play it, from opening the box to finishing the game was like 20, maybe 25 yeah. minutes <laughs> without ever having you know looked at inside the box before mm -hmm. and, and no you know, i agree it's it's that fun bit but you, it doesn't overstay its welcome like a game of ticket to ride can yeah I, I this was a huge surprise to me i think i got it as a gift like i can't even think of why i own ticket to ride new york yeah it was I it was a gift was... you got from from one of your family members yeah pretty sure which is fair they, yeah. they probably found it at chapters right and and fair enough but yeah i i actually love this game like it's, it's just it's got that 
cutthroat. We usually play two, three games in a row. Once you know the game, it's like 10 minutes. The other thing is my kids can play this one, including my youngest, who has difficulty learning games. And the fact I can play this with my girls is fantastic. And it's a great next step, right? Like now that I've got them hooked on that, the next time we have a Christmas Eve party, I could now have them play Ticket to Ride, which we've done with the oldest. So yeah, I was extremely impressed by Ticket to Ride New York. And I have to assume the other city games that are calling it now, the city series, are just as good. Yeah, London, one I know, was the other there's one. There's London, now sure. there's a newer one, too, that's out that includes some of the rules from Europe, which where you, you can push your luck to try to go through tunnels. Right. I'm really impressed by that. Like, I again, I would have never bought that. Like, that was a gift, and I was like, eh, let's give it a shot. I'm yep. like, wow, this is, this is good. Amsterdam, thank you, Everyday Board Games. And that was Ticket to Ride New York. All right, Homeland the Games. This one is totally a hidden gem. This is one of my my strongest recommendations to pick up in this episode for people who like a certain style of game. Now, I know nothing about the series. I, I know it's a U.S., the whatever, Department of Homeland Security versus terrorist thing, but that's about it. I've never seen the show. I am not American. It doesn't, I, I you know, 911 happened. That sucks, but it didn't happen to my country. So I'm not tied to the events in this game. So I am just looking at it from a mechanical standpoint. And this is a fantastic hidden role game. Um, and I am not a fan of social deduction, so there, there's another thing saying this. This one you can usually find cheap, and what I love about this one is there's the good guys, right? There's Homeland Security, and they are trying to prevent terrorist actions happening, and if they prevent enough of them, they win the game. And you have the terrorists trying to, ter- to, to conduct terrorist activities, and if they do enough ter- 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 uh, can't even say it. terrorist activities, they win the game. Great. There's your two factions, right? And you don't know who's who. But then there is also the media faction. And what they want, and I think there's a brilliant commentary on the media, is that they want some terrorist plots to happen because you want ratings, but not too many. And they end up winning the game if there's a balance. And like this to me, and it uses the skill point system where you're playing skill cards into a pile and then you shuffle them and reveal to see if the thing succeeded or failed. And there's things where you can bring in army troops and stuff. Like if you like Battlestar Galactica, which to me is still one of my favorite games of all time, without that chance that someone's going to role play their character and screw it up, and without it taking six hours, check out Homeland. Like it is a really solid hidden trader style game. And that was homeland the game now another tv series tie-in is sons of anarchy uh sons of anarchy the board game this is another one you can usually find cheap both homeland and sons of anarchy i think expected to do well based on the licenses they printed too many copies i don't know i don't know why it's available so cheap uh this is the district 19 of my list i hadn't played the district 19 game the prayer born mentions district 12 District 12, sorry. See, again, I don't watch these things or read these things. Actually, I did watch some movies. Anyway, the, the Hunger Games game, being a Euro, that this is this. This is Sons of Anarchy, the board game, is a worker placement game where you're going to send your bikers to different spots on the board, like strip clubs and dive bars, and collect resources like guns and contraband. I like I would have never pegged Sons of Anarchy to be a medium weight Euro with auction mechanics and bluffing elements. Like this is a solid game uh, for people who dig the mechanics. It has been rethemed to a Dungeons and Dragons theme, uh, which I totally should have put the notes. Is it Dragonfire or is it one of the other D and D games? There is a D and D retheme of this. If you don't like the whole biker gangs and guns and contraband, uh, you can pick that up. Vault of Dragons, I think it's called. Vault of Dragons, yes. Yes, Vault of Dragons. Took me a second. I got it before anyone (laughs) typed it in the chat. Oh, no one has. Yeah, Vault of Dragons is a Dungeons & Dragons update version of it. It's seriously a good game. If you like the theme personally, that theme, I'm not going to play that with my kids, right? Whereas I'll play the D&D one. But I was, again, shocked. Like, someone convinced me, like, you got to buy this. I'm like, like, it's a $5 game. How could it be good? Plus, it's Sons of Anarchy, which I've never seen, and I don't care about biker gangs. I'm no biker. I might be a big guy with long hair and a beard, but I don't ride a bike. I don't have tattoos. But sit down and play this like, oh, no, it's like a solid Euro. You're like, oh, I'm going to go here and collect the guns, and I'm going to go here. And you have these scenes where you're bidding, and you have to actually reveal your hand. And I'm like, like real Euro mechanics. Well, I mean, to be fair, Gale Force 9 does do Tyrants of the Underdark, Firefly yep. the game. You know, they've, they've got a, 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 good, uh, a good solid base on which to build a True. game about bikers. And <laughs> <laughs> but that was Sons of Anarchy from Gale Force 9. 
All right, this is one Deanna suggested I put on the list, and I had to agree with her when she she came up with it, and that is, hey, that's my fish. Uh, this looks like a silly kids game. It's by Fantasy Flight, which is a good indication it's not. But like, this could have easily been a blue orange or a hobby game, in my opinion, with um a bunch of hex tiles with one to three fish on them, and depending on the edition, you have very cute looking penguins of some type, whether they're plastic, whether they're meeple or whatever. I per- mine personally is meeple, and you, p- you lay out the board. All you do on your turn is you're going to move your penguin in a straight line as far as it can go, and then you get to keep the tile it moved off of. The thing is, the tile you're picking up is the board. So as you're playing, the board, the ice sheet, is getting smaller and smaller. And it's all about planting ahead and making sure you get the good t- three fish tiles and, most importantly, cutting your opponents off. That is a big part of the game. Uh, you got a good combination of strategic plates, planning ahead, and tactics of reacting to how your opponents play. This is, again, it's one of those almost chess-like games when you sit down with people who know how to play. Yeah, and that was, hey, that's my fish. Next up, The Climbers, which is not actually a dexterity game. Yeah. It looks like a dex game. You shouldn't play it while drunk. It's got little markers and blocks and ladders that all move throughout the game, but it's not a dex game. You just happen to need a little bit more than drunken dexterity in order to manage what is actually a complex game about movement and paths and blocking your opponents in a limited and ever-changing spatial layout. Yeah, I dig games that make you think spatially, and that's what The Climbers does. Like, one of the big indicators that game's not just a silly dex game. It's put out by Capstone Games. Capstone, like, put out heavy games. And I'm like, what the heck is this block stacking game? That was another one I heard from podcasters. And I'm like, I got to try this. And it's so good. And that was The Climbers. Uh, interestingly, they put out a family edition of that one. Uh, just last, I have not seen that. Just last year, uh, there, there's a Climbers family edition. I'm not sure what, uh, what the difference is, but it's... Uh, uh, with fewer no components clue. no ladders no blocking still, cubes still probably. accommodating two to five players hmm. uh, but with less com- fewer components how odd interesting hmm. again that was the climbers next a big heavy meaty game that I really was not expecting to be big heavy or meaty and that is Dungeon Lords when I saw this game from Check Games Edition and the picture with the little minion on the cover, I thought I was getting a board game version of Dungeon Lords, the computer game. Or not Dungeon Lords, that's the name of the board game. What is it? Dungeon Keeper. Dungeon Keeper, the computer game, which is a game all about digging the right tunnels and abusing your your little goblin and dropping things into pits to get more monsters. And it's, it's almost an action game. Like, there's strategy, but it's, it's, it's an action, silly, over-the-top game. Dungeon Lords is one of the heaviest games I own. It is a game that the designer, I think it's Isaac Childress? No, uh, Vlada Shavato, sorry. I think it's Vlada Shavato. Yeah, Vlada. Uh, give, gives you a number of tutorials to play through and explain how monsters work and how the rooms work and how to play out when the heroes raid your dungeon. And it's complex enough that Vlada actually says, now that you played through this tutorial, ask the players who have played through it if they still want to play because this game is not for anyone, everyone. That is literally in the rule book, and that is what this game is like. This is heavy, meaty. Like you tried to play it with us on, I think you gotta. Yeah, and the, the the interface and not having not having actually sat down and and gone through things made that one just. I mean, oh. it's a three and a half on on BGA or BGG. Yeah, uh, like it's not the heavy. It feels heavier than many other games. Yeah. Well, it, three and a half isn't exactly light. That's yes, you know. Yeah, that that the surprise here, like this was, it, I knew it would be. It's a Tech Games edition, right? Like I expect relative heaviness there. Like they made Pulsar, but I wasn't expecting twice as heavy as Pulsar. Yep. So that was Dungeon Lords. All right, a game we talk about far too often on the show. It seems I don't know why it just seems to come up every episode lately. Is Chocolatiers from Daily Magic Games. Now, this was one, the only reason I took it is I love Daily Magic Games. I have been hooked on their games since discovering them at Origins 2015, 2016, one of those, uh, when Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria was brand new. And I am just a fanboy of them. So I went to their booth at Origins and I 
literally I fanboyed out for a while and I said, I will take every game that I have not played here and bring it home and review it for you. And the main one I was hoping to get at the time was Horizons as well as a couple packs for Valeria I didn't have yet. And with that, they gave me this game Chocolatiers in a small box. I'm like, okay, sure. The next morning, Deanna and I are sitting at the uh, the restaurant in the hotel, and I brought that with me to, to look at the rules while we're having breakfast. And I opened it up, and I'm looking, and I'm like, what what is this? Like, it's, it's a box of chocolates game, and they spent so much money. They put UV coating on the chocolates to make them shiny. Like, And then I started reading the rules, and I'm like, okay. So it's Ticket to Ride because I'm trying to graph chalk, like I'm trying to get sets of colors or sets of chocolates to play to put a tableau in front of me. And I, okay, sure. Oh, well, I, I, I guess I, I got a copy of Horizons to check out. <laughs> then we actually didn't play it. Like I, I had no interest in trying it at Origins. Didn't break it out until weeks later here back at Windsor. And we played the first game. And that's a game where we talked about before that has Eureka moments where you're playing and suddenly you're like, oh, wait where which which one i'm drafting that one's like there's there's a situational positioning the thing same thing i liked in climbers aspect of building your chocolate box and then there's the whole thing we've talked about before about with um any drafting game you go through that evolution of i only care about my stuff oh i care about my opponents and then i have to worry about everyone's stuff so there's that aspect of it and then there's the being able to in cards and then in fact you realize the count of the card the deck is a huge part that certain like some chocolates are more rare than others right and it just from what i expected the game to be it was so much better like the the set collection elements were better the tableau building was better the having to watch your opponents was key it was definitely not multiplayer uh solitaire i i was kind of blown away by just how solid this game was and that was chocolatiers all right one of my kids games that i play more than and have more showing off to other is back cheap this is a blue orange game game that i actually think should be marketed at adults like rethemed somehow because i i the kids at least the age we shot them to have just didn't get the brilliance of this game uh this is similar to hey that my fish in a way except that you have your your hex grid and it's just laid out like you have it set at the beginning and then you have a huge pile of almost poker chip like cheap these are these are really nice chips i don't know they're not poker chips they're green plastic i don't know exactly what they are and what you're going to do is you're going to take any number from that stack and move in a straight line and put that stack down and then your opponent's going to do that and you're going to keep splitting your piles trying to take over the, as much of the board as possible and it's all about cutting people off and, and making sure you don't get yourself cut off. Like if you have a pile of seven sheep and that gets cut off, you, you're going to lose. There's no way you're going to get those sheep out. So you see them go in for your pile of seven. So you run six of those seven across the board. Really neat game that's all about splitting up these pile of sheep. That, Like I said, I, I swear this would sell better marketed to adults with some kind, I don't know what adult theme, but put a Star Wars theme on it where you're spending stormtroopers around Moss Eisley or something and it, it would do better than it would now because the kids just they, they want to play with it the kids love this as a toy they love the the sheep pieces they love the the the, the chips or whatever the the sheep are made out of but uh, like I, maybe I should try it again with them now that they're older but the only reason they kept it is they like playing with the pieces and I think now maybe now that they're in their teens they, they'll they'll appreciate battle sheep for what it is and that was Battle Sheep. All right, I got one more here. I wasn't going to, I didn't have this one on the list, but earlier today I was checking out the awesome Everyday Board Games uh, podcast being recorded here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Everyday Board Games. And the Daniels were talking about games with table presence and they brought up photosynthesis. And I was like, ooh, I need to throw that one in there because that is a game that completely surprised me by how heavy it is how thinky it is and how much, how strategic, how much you have to plan ahead. Now, this is a blue orange game. So when I see blue orange games, I think light games. I don't expect anything heavy from them. like Battleship surprisingly good, but it's still like kids could figure it out. Photosynthesis is all about planting trees with these amazing 3D cardboard trees that you build. And the whole thing is you plant your trees 
and the sun moves around the board and there's three different heights it's either three or four it's been a while since i played this one three or four different heights of trees and they provide shade depending on where the sun is and if your trees in shade it doesn't grow where if it's in the sun it's going to grow and then eventually your trees are going to produce seedlings and the seedlings are going to go out and you got to put those seedlings in the way of the wind like there's just this whole planning ahead for where the sun's going to be and trying to make shade for your opponent's trees while keeping your trees in the sun and honestly it was so much heavier than i thought that i did not enjoy my first couple of plays because it's just not what i wanted and to be honest we are on our honeymoon and we are in the brewer suite at a brewery out in the county and we had had a few drinks and photosynthesis is not a game you want to play after a few drinks and it on a uh, in a way left a bad taste in my mouth. It was so different than what I expected, and I feel bad. What I need to do, I still own it, is I need to give this game a chance and sit down expecting it to be as heavy as it is, and and play it with people expecting that. The other thing too is I was being fast, and this is not a fast game. This is an AP prone, slow thinky game, not a quick plants and trees game. Yeah, that was photosynthesis and i think one thing i think as we're wrapping this up that that really comes to mind is a lot of these games that have surprised us have a couple of things in common and that is companies that have really exceeded our original expectations or original feelings mm -hmm. about them uh from usaopoly becoming the op and mm -hmm. really delivering a fabulously stronger collection of games in general oh yeah uh, that that surprise us from a game that from a company that just used to put out a different version of Monopoly, Pretty um, much. and and now that they have rebranded, they didn't just rebrand to hide themselves. They rebranded because they're putting out new content, uh, and that that's really impressive. They're not just trying to hide the fact that they make mm -hmm. Monopoly games. They're saying, no, look, we're this company now, and look at what we can put out. I think it's time that we should probably actually stop being surprised by the great quality that they're putting out and similarly with ravensburger now mm -hmm. unfortunately prospero hall isn't going to be doing any more ravensburger stuff no I they don't... still they put something out for them just this year uh, so. interesting yeah, well that that it may be both. that may be a long-term thing yeah. but given given the whole relationship with funko and and everything mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see but i think uh you know ravensburger isn't just that uh you know the jigsaw puzzle company anymore yeah they were known for kids' games. They have put out a number of fantastic kids' games for years now. Labyrinth, Magic Labyrinth, those are amazing. Um, Enchanted Forest. They were known for good kids' games, and that hasn't changed. But yes, they are now doing solid licensed games. Though I still think out of all of this, if you look through our list, there's a name that comes up multiple times. We didn't say it every time, and that is Prospero Hall. I am amazed by what this production company has done. Now, maybe you're like me. We didn't realize that we thought Prospero Hall was a person. It is not. It is a an in-house game design company that is part of the Funko team. They are a division of Funko. Um, they did the Funko Pop games. They did Disney Villainous. They did Jaws. They did Back to the Future. They did like, like almost every good uh, the Wonder Woman mass game. market game. Uh, yeah, the, the Wonder the Wonder Woman game. Yeah, uh, uh, Minecraft Builders and Biome yeah. we mentioned earlier. Uh, like, they are just honestly knocking it out of the park. Like, like if, if Prospero Hall was a person, they'd be a Stephen Feld to <laughs> me at this point. Yeah. Like, I am almost at the point where I want to try everything they make. Like, it is, they make such good games. Horrified, we oh, mentioned villainous. earlier. Villainous, yeah. Disney Villainous. Like, like Villainous, I think, might have been their first big hit. That, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was what I think what everyone got, got on everyone's radar, at least. Yeah. So yeah, just really impressed by Prospero Hall. So they follow us online. Maybe they listen to the show or someone from them listened to the show. But big shout out to them for, for making mass market. And because a lot of these are target exclusives now. So mass market games and licensed games actually good. Um, I, I, it's amazing in a way to me <laughs> compared to so many years. Like I have been, I've been playing games since the 80s, technically probably since the 70s you count. My, my kids games and like licensed games was a bad thing like if a game had said star wars on it you bought it because it said star wars not because it's going to be good or if it said indiana jones or or et like there right. is not a good et game there you go hey prospero hall or restoration games how about an indiana jones or a, a, a et nowadays i don't think anyone cares <laughs> indiana jones would be cool though 
So yeah, that's a that's a shout out. That that's our that's our honorable mention. Basically, every game <laughs> made by Prospero Hall until you realize they're all good is going to surprise you for a while. Yep. Uh, and then again, they've got you know the Pop Tarts game coming out. They've got uh, Disney yeah, Haunted Mansion, Disney Haunted Mansion, Hocus on, Pocus, uh, yeah, uh, Disney Jungle Cruise Adventure. Um, you know, there's a The Shining is even a <laughs> they've even got uh, Top Gun, which was mm-hmm. maybe not their most standout game from what I've seen, but still had some solid aspects in it. I mean, it's one of the few volleyball board games. There you go. Yeah, people are going nuts right now online for Pan Am. Yeah. A lot of people are going nuts for Pan Am right now. I did a demo of um, Hocus Pocus, really neat co-op game that is honestly like an improvement on Go Fish, of all things, where you're trying to get all your potion ingredients to match either the color or the symbol, but you're allowed to ask your opponents one question every round, like, hey, do you have any Eye of Newt? But that's all you're allowed to ask, and you have to play based on it. That was really neat. Um, Oh, just, I I did enough. Prospero Hall, definitely big thumbs up for everything they've been doing. Actually, I didn't realize, they actually did some Z-Man games. Choose your own adventure stuff. Uh, They did the War with the Evil Power Master, uh, based off the the old R.A. Montgomery book. Yeah, yeah, the the Which Way book one. Yeah. So I didn't know that was them either. I haven't tried any of those games. All right, so there you have a number of games that surprised us. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our, cha- in our chat room has anything to add. I saw quite a bit going through. Quite a bit going through. So yeah. one correction, it was, it was our anniversary, not honeymoon. I thought <laughs> I said anniversary. I guess not. So I'm going to have to scroll back here because there's a lot. Um, Amsterdam, I, we got was as the, uh, the newest of the city games for the Ticket to Ride. Yeah. So it's uh, New York, London, Amsterdam. Uh, oh, and apparently, check out the uh, Board Game Geek for uh, Star Wars Risk as the designer did some rule tweaks to uh, just oh. improve it even more. That's good to know. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know about the Sons of Anarchy retheme. A lot of people missed that the Vault of Dragons is is a retheme with D&D, right. which is kind of cool. Uh, uh, Dungeon Keeper got some Dungeon Keeper love. Uh, some people do prefer Sons of Anarchy over D anD D, which is perfectly legit. Absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with you know if if it was it was a solid series. It didn't really do anything for me. It's not my my kind of TV, but uh, you know I know my wife loved it. I know tons of people were massive fans of yeah, that. Yeah, to be show. honest, it's it's in my queue actually because I I just finished Hell on Wheels and I was thinking of moving over to that as of the next AMC series I watch. Right, uh, Dungeon Lords Pets. I've never played. I have heard that's good. Uh, I don't know if that was something that was a surprise or not. Uh, supposedly, it's good for the poo cubes. Oh, unfortunately, I'm seeing bits of chat that I think were replies to stuff we said. <laughs> so I'm yeah. not sure. Battleship popular. All right. Well, I'm looking through these. What game surprised you, chat room? What games surprised you? you didn't expect? Yeah, a lot of Kenny love. G keeping it sexy. There we go. That was another one of those, uh, another one of the Prospero Hall ones, because they also did Bob uh, Bob Ross as well, right? Yep. Marvel yep. Villainous. So. So everyday board games. Uh, one Shobu. Of the Manuals says Shobu. 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 Shobu yeah. looks. That's the one with the white and the black, and when you move on one side, you have to move on the other. I think that's the one. That looks really good. That is on the Deanna. This. Uh, we love the Duke and War Chest, and that style of game is huge for us. But date nights when we we go out. Yeah, it's actually ranked 30 on Abstract Games right now on Board Game Geek. Yeah, it's the one I was thinking of. Oh, it's Smirk and Dagger. I have a contact there. Well, there you go. Although we oh, kind of Smirk and up. Laughter, not Smirk and Dagger. They're the same company. Okay. It's one side's their backstabbing games and one uh, side's their party games. All right. Okie dokie. That's not one I know. Pretty thinky, but very cute. Better than most Abstract. We are going to have that one out. Card game for the queen. I don't. I don't call for the queen a card game. I call that an RPG. But yes, that is definitely <laughs> a go-to for grown-ups who've never played an RPG. I could see that for the queen. I am a big fan of. Yep. I played that with uh, Danielle, who we we gamed with the other day. Unmatched. I missed that one. So unmatched because they played Funkoverse and thought it would be the same. Yeah, they are not. <laughs> Funkoverse <laughs> yeah. and Unmatched are very different. Uh, Funkoverse all about card management as well as positioning. I or sorry, yeah, unmatched. The Funko games really did shock me. I I don't feel the need to ne- own them. I like miniature wargaming. For me, I just jumped to like Warhammer um, Shadespire. 
which you and I played there with the, the yeah. corn berserkers versus like that's more my style of skirmish war game. Uh, Kortor Corridor. Corridor is a good one. I haven't played Corto, but Corridor is one that could have been on my list. I just forgot about it. I don't own it. My dad owned a copy and I don't know where it went. Like he might have lent it to someone. That's one of those games that you used to buy at like the men's store that just like you leave out on your coffee table. It's made of solid wood. Right. And it's all about trying to get your opponents to the other of um, the board, but every turn you're going to put a wall. So it's wall off the opponent while trying to make a path for yourself. Right. It's fantastic. Corto is, uh, if I remember correctly, is a match four. But with stacking, that's a good one. Uh, Twitter earlier, random scrub said tiny towns looks like an adorable light puzzle, but ended up completely melting my brain. And I gotta agree, tiny towns is heavier than you'd think. Like the the positioning, um, town center is one I thought about putting on the list, but I knew it was gonna be as brain burning as it is when I bought it. But you look at it, and again, it looks like a block stacking game, but it's it's that one where you're positioning. Uh, residential units and hotels and they, things grow organically based on what they're next to and that one breaks my brain every time i love it but i played with so many people that hate it interesting one i'm one that keeps pop, popping up in my head tonight uh but i haven't played in so long that i can't actually remember was drop it that we played at uh oh, qcc yeah. I, I don't know if that's a prior it was it was exactly what i thought it would be and it was well, awesome see to me for me the 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 complexity of the rules, right? The interaction of all the different things you can't do is really yeah. what made that game stand out where it seems like it's a silly little, uh, you know, a silly little sort of dexterity connect four. But then you start thinking about oh. the levels of, of rules and things you can't do well, in yeah, order to score have the a same point. Symbol touch or the same color. And then there's some on the edges. Yeah, yeah. The biggest surprise for me in that one was how the pieces move. Yeah. But I wouldn't say it's a huge shock, like I'd throw it on the list, but I was surprised just the physics of that game and how slippery things were. Yep. Things did not move how I expected them to move. Indeed. And actually, that's one that could have gone on the, sh on the, uh, the Everyday Board Games show today, too, because like, that actually has some yeah, good table presence. That is some good table presence. Uh, Ryan, Town Center, you could definitely do it. With blindness, well, you'd, you'd have to be really good at spatial recognition in your head, but you could easily somehow have another player tell you what color your cubes are or add something to the cube so you can touch it. The problem is you need to pull them from a blank randomly, but once they're out, it's just drafting. So you could, I, I think you could, as long as you could visualize the actual board with the cubes on them. I, with help, I think you could definitely play that one. I love town center, but like I, Oh wait, Neil is a heavy gamer. Neil likes heavy games. Neil likes flippy game uh, or uh, likes, likes, heavy strategy games likes pvp neil's one of the heavy gamers in the area and it's from um company that does heavy games normally and so i taught it to neil and neil this almost flipped the table he rage quit he literally left in the middle of the game and and went out for a smoke and went home like he didn't come back and we're like I, that game pissed him off that much for him just not getting how it worked and getting frustrated with it and that is the reaction i've gotten with town center i dig it but I, I I almost I might get rid of my copy because I've I haven't found like four locals to play it with who all like it. Right. Paris La City et la Lumière. I don't know that one. It's a 2019 game from uh Devere Games, although a, a ton of other different people. Uh players compete for their moment in the light by placing oddly shaped building tiles. That sounds cool. Yet another poly polyominoes are the thing. No one seemed to notice that. Everyone noticed everyone's doing rolling rights. Everyone's doing polyominoes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Copenhagen. You got all the a Ube action terms. drafting, area majority influence drafting, tile placement. Polyominoes exploded in the last little while. All right, I think we probably got enough. Um, one uh, at Shobu, I had in the notes for Danielle, <laughs> but hey, Daniel's in the chat, so I didn't have to say that one. There we go. The Grizzled. I See, The Grizzled was about what I expected. The Grizzled is a really good game. That is a cooperative game. The art is amazing. Uh, the tie-in to uh, Je suis Charlie, is it? It's been a long time since that happened. A, a really neat game, but to me, it didn't surprise me in any way. I was just like, wow, yep, this is good. Yep. All right. Oh, there we go. Finally. Before we move on, 
remember always if you've got a game or game night question for us a topic to cover like surprisingly complex games head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or just email questions tabletopbellhop.com up next a look at gloomhaven jaws of the lion and what's different in this new gloomhaven intro box set when compared to the original gloomhaven Thank you, Tabletop Renaissance, Windsor's newest game store, for providing us with a review copy of Jaws of the Lion. All right, so Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is published by Cephala Fair Games, as you'd expect. It was designed by Isaac Childress, same as the original, and features artwork from a number of artists. And I do apologize if I get these names wrong. So we got Francesca Berard, Kat Bach, David Bach, David Demerit, Alexander Eichlev, Jason D. Kingsley, and Josh T. McDowell. It was originally released as a Target exclusive in July 2020, and interestingly, this is the first time this happened. It was only a one-month exclusive, which is something new for the board game industry, then was released to the rest of the world, including here in Canada, in August. The best way for you to see what you get in this new Gloomhaven box set is to check out our Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, that one's fries being surprisingly popular, so I'm really happy with the way that one turned out. All right, so we are going to start off with the components here. Normally, I don't go through all the components, but what I want to talk about is what's new. So what are the new components? What's something different than you get in the original? And I got to say, the first thing, one of the most welcome additions, we were talking about this when we were talking about the Shadowrun box set the other day, is a two-page, well, one-page, one two-sided, welcome to Gloomhaven guide that not only walks you through how to use the contents of this box and what everything is, but it actually tells you how to organize and sort them, which I thought was really cool because this version of Gloomhaven comes with a plastic box insert and a number of baggies. And this guide actually tells you what to bag with what and where to put it all in, which is pretty dang cool. Now, I think it is valuable to point out, however, that you haven't really loved this insert. Uh, it's not. The thing is, it's just not as good as it could be. And it just feels like they needed more playtesting or like the design graphics when they had it in AutoCAD or whatever people use nowadays worked great. But then when they physically produced the product, it didn't work out as well because of mold shrink or something like it's just it's so close. Right. So one of the things they give you is a tray to put in all the, the chips. There are two destroyed tokens that will not fit like they, they literally go over the top. Like there is a lid and it kind of holds them in place. And then to fit the rest, they fit, but you have to perfectly stack them. So you can't just like toss all the money in. You need to stack it to get it to fit. And then you get to the fact that the monsters, when you organize them, which we'll get to this in a minute, are in baggies. There's nowhere to put these baggies. So they basically just get dumped in the box. And it just, it's, it's like, it's so close. And that's what frustrates me. It is, I got to say, better than having to go out and buy an $80 box insert to organize my game. So into the rest of the components, this box includes four completely new characters, all of which are unlocked at the start of the game. So there's no spoilers here. Uh, these are designed so they can be also be used as new classes in Gloomhaven, which is a, a nice addition. So that aspect of Jaws of the Lion can be an expansion to the original as well as being characters you can play in this game. Now, as part of the onboarding system that we're going to mention multiple times tonight, these card decks are split up more than in Gloomhaven. They're not just one through character level nine. You start off with a set of eight cards, for example, and there are only six of them. And then there's you're going to slowly more, add more cards because there's two B cards. And after you finish the first scenario, you swap out two A cards for these B cards. And then eventually you unlock your one cards and then you unlock your X cards. So it's, it's definitely split up more. And those A cards... Are, are have more information on them and are simpler. They have text boxes on them. And these new cards are very clear about how they work, what you can do, and in fact, notably superior in their clarity compared to a normal Gloomhaven card. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna when we get into some of the changes in this game, some of the changes they made for the cards are fantastic. Now there are 16 monsters. Surprisingly, they're not all new. Ten of them are new. Three of those new ones are boss monsters. I did think it was a little strange that they overlapped. I kind of figured they give you all new monsters or not new monsters. Now, are these monsters portable over to the main game? Not at all. Not at all compatible, even with the exact same name. 
The decks are different. They are standalone. They are not meant to be combined with the original. They are retooled and reworked. Now, I don't know if they're made simpler, or clearer, or what, what the honest difference is. Uh, the one thing I will note, every monster deck had a the usual, where the monster just did a basic move and attack. Gloomhaven, not every monster had that. So that's at least one simpler card. So I think in general, all the cards are simplified slightly, but definitely not compatible. Now, what you won't find in this box are map tiles. No hexes here, no things you have to fit together, or overlays to go on maxes. Maxes? On maxes, on maps, sorry. No overlays to go on the maps. Instead, all the scenarios and maps are presented in a lay-flat spiral-bound book. Uh, there's the scenario book. It's got 25 scenarios. The first five are introductory scenarios that slowly introduce the rules of play one by one. In addition to the main scenario book, there's this weird supplemental scenario book, which I thought was a kind of brilliant way to do it. And basically, it's what you use if they couldn't fit everything in the first book. And what's neat is sometimes they use that to make the map bigger. So I thought that was cool. And to be honest, it would be rather disappointing if the maps were all small enough to fit in that one lay flat book. And thankfully, they didn't start changing scale yes. or something horrible like that in order to make it fit into that one yeah, there's, to be honest, there's no reason you couldn't overlay map tiles onto this or the overlays from Gloomhaven on this. So again, these are standalone scenarios. Um, mythic, mythically, myth-wise, uh, background, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, fluff, the, the story-wise, this lore. story actually happens, the lore is that this game happens before Gloomhaven. This is actually a prequel to the story told in Gloomhaven. So there is no actual overlap in scenarios, but there's no reason you couldn't like put door tiles on the doors in this game instead of using the doors that are there, for example. Uh, you do get a new map. Uh, this is significantly smaller than the one in the original game. The original game is a nice big fold-out board. This is just one solid mounted board. This just shows the town of Gloomhaven itself, and you get a set of 25 stickers that you'll put on the map, one for each scenario. No, the stickers aren't actually that useful considering it's on rails at this point, anyway, so far, what you've seen. Yeah, well, again, I haven't even gotten through the five intro scenarios at this point, so I, I don't want to talk to that because I'm hoping it branches at some point in the future, but I don't actually know that. Right. Um, interesting to note for the stickers, I don't remember if I talked about this later in the show notes, is uh, they do note the stickers are optional because in this game, unlike the original Gloomhaven, there is nothing you need to destroy. There is nothing that's moved from the game. So if you did not use the stickers, you could easily pass on your copy of Jaws of the Lion to someone else when you were done with it. All right. Now, as for the rules, they're split over two different booklets. Anyone who's played a Fantasy Flight game is going to get flashbacks here, though I got to say they're written better than most things from Fantasy Flight. Uh, there's a learn to play guide, which very slowly and deliberately walks you through how to play the game. This is the type of book where you don't even read it before you sit down to play. You read it out loud with your group as you open up the box. It holds your hand through the first five scenarios. And each new scenario is going to add new elements to the game. And very distinctly just points out, this is all you need to know. Along with this guide, there is a glossary. Now, this is the rule book. And what it is, is this is all the keywords and core concepts in detail. And the only time you even touch that book is if something comes up during play and you're a little confused. Like, well, wait a minute, I'm doing a ranged attack. What's line of sight in this? Or, hey, wait a minute, how does this work? You're going to reference it. Well, hopefully that means we don't have to do another FAQ read-through for this one. Though, knowing how popular they are, maybe we will anyway. Yeah, the, sadly, what we do need to do is a errata read-through for the scenario book and the rule books, which is slightly disappointing for a game that was just published. Now, there are a number of new uh, cards. There are event cards that are, again, specific to Jaws of the Lion. There are item cards, battle goal cards. All the scenarios take place in Gloomhaven, so there's no road events here. Now, regarding the battle cards, this is an interesting one. It's a note that some of these goals were inspired by a fan-created deck that was called Satire's Extended Battle Cards. And I guess Isaac worked with Satire to actually adopt some of these into Jaws of the Lion. And I got to thank our guy in the chair, Temujin, for that bit of uh, information, that little bit of trivia. I thought that was really cool. Now, as for the rest of the stuff, it's all stuff we've already seen in Gloomhaven. So I'm not going to go into details about standees and monster and tiles and element boards and all that stuff is all the same. This is just the new stuff. So now that we know about the interesting new stuff that comes with Jaws of the Lion, how about you tell us about some of the actual 
rule changes, and deviations from the original Gloomhaven. Yeah, there's a surprising number of these. Like, everything I'd seen online, people talking about this, everyone's talking about the first two things I'm going to mention, which is uh, focus changing and line of sight, but there's more to it than that. Um, so in addition to the fact there's a learn to play book, right. And these five introduction scenarios that slowly teach the rules like that is an, a fantastic improvement just off the original right there. There are actual rule changes. And the biggest one that people like to debate is a monster focus change. Now focus is based on how far it takes a monster to move into attack. Ties are now broken by initiative. And this mostly affects ranged attacks. And this is about a six paragraph thing in the rule book and i'm not going to get into it here uh you can read the full text on the blog post um that'll be published for this on the written review i actually like wrote out the full text but if you just google jaws of the lion focus you can find lots of people debating it and talking about it there is a change now this was done to make things simpler and quicker to make the man monster ai quicker and easier to figure out a number of people are talking about adapting this to gloomhaven Isaac himself prefers the original Gloomhaven rules, but has said, play the game how you like. Well, at least on the surface, things certainly seem to uh, be improved. And judging by how fast you burn through those first three scenarios, even though they, they are, of course, learning, you know, rank uh, graded scenarios, the speed change has definitely been noticeable. Yeah, it's definitely. Plus, we do have a lot of experience playing Gloomhaven, so that's something I probably should have noted at the top of this. At this point, we have not finished a Gloomhaven campaign, but we have played probably 50 sessions of Gloomhaven, so we are not new to Gloomhaven. Uh, line of sight. This is a very welcome change to me. This is so simple now. All it is is if you can draw a line from any part of the attacker's hex to any part of the target's hex without crossing a wall, you have line of sight. Yeah, and this, and, you know... <laughs> Thank God. As a viewer listening to Gloom, Gloomhaven players gauge and work on line of sight and, and, and debate and argue about line of sight was not the most fun mm. part of the viewing experience. Oh, so many weird rules from measuring from a corner that was touching a wall, not counting, and need to find enemy. Some of the scenarios. No, this is, this is a huge improvement. Now, here's one that people may overlook as a change, and that is a significant change to advantage-disadvantage rules that makes the game simpler. This comes to when an ambitious, ambiguous uh, situation comes up. And in the original Gloomhaven, if you had an ambiguous situation, so I drew a plus two and a plus one wound, what's better, right? And that's totally situational, so it's ambiguous. In Gloomhaven, you're stuck with the first card you drew. In Jaws of the Lion, you get to pick. Right. Well, as long as you're hitting the monsters, plus two all the way. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so it's the reason apparently that Isaac mentions, and we'll go back, just jumping back to focus a little bit. The reason he, he suggests the sticking with the original focus is uh, to not confuse Gloomhaven players. So yeah. if you are a Gloomhaven player and you are used to the initial focus rules as they have always been, go ahead and keep playing those because all we did was change them to simplify the game for new players. And that's the reason for the change and why he supports, why he plays with the old focus rules. Mm -hmm. All right, another one I really like is the new iconography showing which monsters to spawn depending on the player count. Uh, it's right on the map. It's got bars underneath. It is completely clear. Um, that is one that I have seen people mess up many times with the original. Now, the benefit of not having generic tiles right there, but that also means I'm guessing that you can't do random dungeons in Jaws of the Lion. No, there are no random dungeon rules. There, there is a, a Basically, if I don't mention it in the, the start there, it's probably not in Jaws of the Lion, even if it was in Gloomhaven. Now, another welcome change is that players can now trade items. This is huge. Plus, when you find treasure during a scenario, the player who found that treasure can use it during that scenario. Also, even if they couldn't hold that item at the start of the scenario, they can use it. So even if you already had two items, you get a third, you can still use it. And then when you're selling, this is a, another, this is a change. I'll bet you a lot of people are going to miss. When selling items, you now round up instead of round down when selling. But note, one of the things that is in Gloomhaven that isn't in this is renown. There is no reputation score in Jaws of the Lion. So prices on the card aren't going to be modified. So you don't get like a discount for being the heroes or pay more for doing badly. Um, also, though, you still can't trade or share gold. So gold is still personal, but items can be shared. Which, which I don't know. I mean, 
you are supposed to be playing parties in both games in gloom and in i mean you are you are a group a party uh, uh, you're a mercenary company that is in it for the money that is uh, strictly stated right in the rules so i think that's where the money thing comes in uh, yeah. and that was the original argument for not trading items either right okay it's, it's you're a party but you're a party of mercenaries right which in gloom you are not heroes either necessarily you you can totally go either way with the reputation system right but yeah the 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 if you can trade items why can't you trade gold i can totally get the problem is it would affect a lot of the battle goals which is an aspect of the game that has a little people playing for themselves right uh still talking about items but specifically treasure and loot um uh, monsters can now loot treasure tiles so watch out for slimes next to treasure chests though thankfully there are no slimes in this but ooze if you're going to port the rules over to the main gloom haven those ooze are going to eat up those treasure tiles and some of those things. Uh, but in general, yes, they can loot the treasure. Um, Suburban monsters drop coins. And I got to say, it's silly that they drop coins. Like, it doesn't make sense that they're supposed to be some monsters, but so much easier to keep track of. One of the things I hate in the original Gloomhaven is trying to keep track of what was a summon and what wasn't. Even using the Gloomhaven helper app made that difficult. Um, another change that to me just made sense is in the previous rules, the rule for an empty square was there is nothing in it, no tile, no overlay, nothing. They now said coins don't count, which is actually a huge, just makes sense yeah, that the it, coins it, on the floor don't take up space. Yeah, there's some interesting shift there, but I think redefining the empty space really just makes a lot of sense and avoids confu really some really easily confusing uh, things that you could be looking at. Uh, there is a new step to combat that I like. Uh, this is using initiative tokens. These are something totally new in Jaws of the Lion. Every character and every monster comes with this tiny initiative token. And this is neat because all it is is when, when you've all flipped over your cards, you set these tokens up in order, which is great for keeping track of when who, everyone's going and is even better for players who forget what initiative they picked. Now, normally for our Gloomhaven games, we do use the Gloomhaven helper app, so it's taken care of. But for people who don't use the app, a, a nice addition. Yeah, and I think we, we do generally recommend you should be using the app. But if you, uh, you, know, if you prefer the au naturel version, uh, it is definitely a major benefit. I do have one complaint is they are too tiny and all the monsters are the same color. It would have been nice to tell them apart from across the board, but it's still a nice touch. Like It, it could have been better, but it's, it's fine. Yeah. Now, another one, we kind of hinted at this one earlier, is the fact they have added dotted lines to the ability cards. And what the dotted line means is that they separate individual actions. This makes the card so much easier to read and to see what part of the card applies to what other part of the card and how things interact. And you can check out our FAQ from Gloomhaven about for lots of rants on that particular topic. Yes, they, the, the, the card layouts are so much better. <laughs> All right, the final rule change, and this is another one that people are probably going to miss if, they, if they're not careful, is that city events have become mandatory. In Gloomhaven, anytime you end a scenario and go back to town, you can do a city event. In Jaws of the Lion, after every scenario, you must do a city event. And note, there's an errata for the end of scenario four where it doesn't remind you of this. Well, so now we know what's changed. What are your thoughts on these changes? All right. So I'm pretty sure you can get uh, the gist already from what I've had to say. I am extremely impressed overall by what Gloomhaven Jaws the Lion brings to the table. Like almost everything added to this box was done to make Gloomhaven a more accessible game. Something that could appeal to a more casual audience. Because Gloomhaven is not a light game. It is not an Ameritrash chuck and dice D, D in a box style game this is a hand management resource management euro style game it's a cooperative puzzle whereas jaws of the lion makes that puzzle easier i and this onboarding and accessibility starts even with the price right uh, jaws of the lion is very in my very reasonably priced for what you get in this box this is not a light or small box the fact that it has a box insert is really nice. And the fact even has instructions how to sort your bits is another part of the onboarding system I like. Though the highlight really is that learn to play guide. The first five scenarios that slowly introduce the rules one game aspect at a time is brilliant. 
like I am, I'm not going to get into full details here, but like they did su such smart things as in the first scenario, you don't have a monster attack deck. All the monsters just act the same. They act on initiative 50, they move one and attack anyone next to them. Done. So you don't even have to worry about that aspect of seeing monsters doing different things every turn. And it's a great way to teach the monster AI for melee combat. Like it's just little things like that. Every single one of the rule changes I thought were great. Welcome changes. I wouldn't complain about a single one of them. Uh, some of them seem to be done to make the game easier and play, easier to play and understand. Uh, specifically, the new focus and line of sight rules are definitely simpler. Other ones seem to be things players have been asking for and wanting in house ruling, especially if you look through board game geek threads. I uh, like the ability to trade items and f having a way to track initiative that's better than having to remember what cards people played. So I, I think it's a mix of things to make the game more accessible and things that I think people have been hoping for. Right. So now one thing, and this came up in the chat room, and I think it's, it's something I saw watching through some of your first plays, is as experienced Gloomhaven players, right? So people who, who know Gloomhaven and know and, and have worked out a lot of the quirks and things, what about these intro games in particular has sort of been a little problematic because, again, you're actually having to unlearn mm -hmm. a lot of things that you know. The hardest thing by far is using rules that haven't been introduced yet. So in like, there is no such thing as a long rest until scenario four. There is no such thing as using the basic abilities of your card in scenario one. I, that's either introduced in scenario two or three. I can't remember which one right hand. So it's that whole, you're just going to play expecting all the rules to be there. Uh, so some of it is error proof. So for example, by giving you those A cards, there are no burn cards. There's no cards that are lost as spending them. So you can't screw that up. Yeah. And there are no elemental infusions on the A or B cards. So again, you're not going to make think of using And that's where they provide actually with sample monster decks too. There are the Vermling Raider deck, right? But there's also the basic Vermling Raider deck that's only four cards. And again, Isaac was brilliant enough that none of those have push or pull. And none of those have element infusions. So you can't screw it up if it's not there. But then there's the other things where you're just like the, the short rest, the long rest, the using your basic attack, um, things like that. You're just going to be able to discard cards instead of taking damage is something you can't do in the early scenarios. So it's the unlearning what you've learned could be a problem. But to be honest, it's not going to hurt. Like the right. only reason I got a little frustrated with the fact we met once is to record the video as a okay, so could learn how to play or we are using we're not supposed to be able to eat it but as players who are playing gloomhaven just use the full rules like it's it's not gonna you're not gonna break anything right and trust me the scenarios i gotta say this is they're almost too easy in a way the the same way you have a problem with uh harry potter hogwarts battle right the ramp up at scenario four is significant it is it is a big jump as seasoned gloomhaven players we got someone down to one hit point like it was, it was close. We could have easily had one character exhausted. I have seen other local gamers and players who are not familiar with Gloomhaven get very frustrated by scenario four. And so the onboarding is nice, but it does ramp up significantly, right. but in a way it has to, because Gloomhaven is not an easy game and it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be an RPG. It's not meant to be, the game is the DM and it's going to walk you through a story. No, it's going to try to punish you and beat you down. Now, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, the they asked in the chat, if you are an ex experienced Gloomhaven player, can you skip to, uh, you know, four or five or, or do you need to go, do you need to go through the, uh, the beginner adventures? For one, you'll need to go through to get the experience. So unless you're like, you could just jump to the reward section and write it down and do it. But you know what? It was fun. Like, I, I don't see why not. Like, being able to kick some Vermling butt in Scenario 1 was kind of fun. Plus, another big part of Gloomhaven is learning your cards and learning your character class. So this is a good way to get used to your character class. Though, again, because you swap out your cards, that's a little little weird. So here's, here's a side note. So I'm, I'll finish your, yours, and then I have a side note. Um, I just don't see why you wouldn't. And the other thing is, like, we were able to finish the first three scenarios in one night in about an hour and a half, I think. And that's with, like, streaming and, and moving microphones and moving cameras. Like, they're, they're not long. Once you get to scenario four, you're still – that one's maybe 45 minutes to an hour. You could probably play through all five at once uh, in one sitting if you if you had a long enough game night. And you I just streaming. don't see why you wouldn't. 
Yeah, if you weren't streaming. I just don't see why you wouldn't, to be honest. You could, though, but definitely get the rewards. Like, like because you're going to need those to get the experience right. before. Again, I'm, I, I'm slightly spoiling things here, but you, you will need to, to have the experience to get into the main the main Makes story. Sense. Plus, you're, and you, you're going to want to read out the story and stuff like that. Uh, scenario one, if anything, you could probably really, like, there's really, like, come on, the monsters don't even, you don't even flip up actions. They, they move one and attack two right. over and over and over. Um, now, to the other topic, this is something I actually found a little frustrating. They change the deck so often. So you start off with six cards that it walks you through very clearly. They're all basically moves and attacks and possibly heals. Like, there's no push-pull. There's no elemental infusions. Um, they haven't even added burst or multiple target attacks at this point. And you're like, all right, got great. Then they take two of the cards and they just change those two cards. And you get new versions of those cards that are more complicated. One of those is going to be a burn card. So now you can do something really cool, but you lose the card. And you're going to also add possibly a push, pull, or a status effect, a stun, or poison or something, right? And But it's still the same card. It does the same thing. Then you get your one cards. And then suddenly you have to basically relearn the whole character. Despite the fact the cards have the same names, they no longer do the same things. So, for example, a card way through the game was I can move the enemy three squares, like right from the beginning. I'm like, all right, I move them three squares, I move them three squares. All of a sudden, it not only moves them one square unless dark is infused, and then I can infuse dark to move them two more. And that is such a different card and so much more situational. And there was definitely a learning curve. And again, that hits at scenario four. So besides the difficulty ramping up at scenario four, you now have to relearn your entire character, which it just felt odd. Like, I, like the, the basic cards were so far from the cards you ended up with. And I kind of get it, because the basic cards have to be there to teach you. And while the one cards have to be there because you can play these characters in Gloomhaven, so they have to be compatible and comparable to the other level one cards for the other Gloomhaven classes. So there's definitely a thing there. So so that is an odd feeling. I, I, I'm not saying good or bad, but there's a definite, like I said, a jump. You hit scenario four, and it's like, oh, I got to learn how to play my character again. I thought I knew what I was doing. And I don't know how much Sean's going to edit the live stream, but you can see it in the live stream because there is a significant section of silence as Deanna and I basically relearn how to play the game. Yep. There were some there were some clips and cuts and, and zooms, but uh, you know, again, even even uh, you know, it's it's an hour. So the episode one uh, is is one hour, start to finish, including all of the you know general. Hey, you're watching well, YouTube. Well, how to play. YouTube. That one, I basically yeah. teach you how to play Gloomhaven in it. Yeah. So. so we'll see. We'll see how the second one goes. That one I that one will be editing tomorrow probably, and we'll see uh, We'll see how that one goes for next week. So what what I what I'm most impressed by is Jaws of the Lion does what it sets out to do. It's exactly the point of this box set is to make Gloomhaven more accessible to people. And this is by far, if anyone was like, oh, I kind of want to get into Gloomhaven, I'm going to tell them about Jaws of the Lion. I don't suggest anyone jump to the full game. And it's probably going to be the same thing for Frosthaven when it comes out. Jaws of the Lion is your starting spot. This is your, you're going to get onboarded so much better. It's going to slowly ramp up. It's going to show you how to play. It's going to point out to you that this is not your 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 typical Dungeons and Dragons, roll the dice, beat up the bad guys kind of game. Uh, the step-by-step introductory scenarios are brilliant. As for the rules changes, I liked all of them. Um, there's going to be a number of groups out there that take these and put them into Gloomhaven, and I can see it. I am going, we're going to have to sit down once Tori and Kat are back over and we're playing and talk about including some of these. Like being able to trade things, I don't think it's going to break Gloomhaven. Plus, I, the new line of sight rules, I think that one I'm going to insist. Like, I don't care. Sorry, we're using those people. Yeah, are, I don't, I don't see do Tori it. especially. I don't see arguing about that. Because yeah, exactly. you guys, the number of times. Again, you know, again, as a viewer, as someone who watches your Gloomhaven plays, yeah. line of sight questions come up a lot. All the time. All the, and, and our guy in the chair points us <laughs> points yep. out when we mess them up often. Yep. The other thing that I really like about Jaws of the Lion is I now have a version of Gloomhaven I could bring down to the CG realm and show off. I could sit the uh, scenario 5 or scenario 4 and show other people how to play without spoiling anything. The original Gloomhaven, yes, you can go back and replay through a scenario, but I don't want to hand anyone uh, the whatever 
Vermly Mind Thief deck who's never played before and say go, which is how you had to do it before. Yeah. I, I like I could easily sit down and do a demo night, say at the CG Realm, give me a one hour time slot and get people through scenario one through four or one through three at least, and then probably explain how four and five work and probably sell significant copies of the game just by doing that. Yeah, and I can totally see sitting down and maybe playing scenario 17 in this a lot easier than breaking out Gloomhaven to play a scenario I've already beaten before. Yeah. Well, for a more in-depth look at Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Well, today we're going to take a look at Mermaid Adventures Revised, a family-friendly setting book for the PIP System Core Book. One note before we start, we were provided with a review copy of this source book from Third Eye Games. Uh, it's also worth noting, like many of the re uh, re RPG reviews we've done lately due in the time of pandemic, this is a read review. I have sat down, read the source book, but sadly haven't had a chance to get it to the table yet. Now, this one is something I can play with my kids. So I am hoping to get it to the table soon. So look forward to an actual play report and an actual play review sometime in the future. Now, finally note, this is a review of Mermaid Adventures Revised, which matters. This is not the original Mermaid Adventures RPG. The original Mermaid Adventures is the RPG I chose to introduce my girls to uh, and first, their first role-playing experience. And you can check out my review of that edition on the blog or back to podcast episode 94, Black Lives Matter, where we featured Aloy LaSanta. Now, at times during this review, I am going to be comparing the two different versions because they are significantly different in a number of ways. So during the, during, due to this being an RPG review, we won't be pointing you towards an unboxing video today. No, but what I can tell you is that uh, the production quality of the book was pretty solid. Um, the version I have is the color soft cover edition. As far as I know, it only comes in color. Uh, you can also get it in PDF format. Uh, the version I have is a digest size paperback book that clocks in at 100 pages long, which includes a table of contents, a character sheet, and an index. The other thing to note, though, that is, I think, very important is this is not a complete game. This is not a game on its own. It is not playable standalone. The PIP system core book is required to use this book. Now, this is a notable change from the original, which was standalone and, while not expensive, it's important to know that you will need an additional purchase in order to play your new mermaid game. Now, similar to the PIP system core book, Mermaid Adventures is full color, features a lot of excellent diverse artwork, including all kinds of merfolk and potential adversaries. If you think all merfolk are half fish, half person, you need to check this book out. There are some really interesting ideas here. Uh, the font is larger than normal, kind you'd expect in like a kid's book or a young adult book, uh, which is nice. I appreciate that. Um, it also features a two-column layout, uh, basically the same layout as the PIS system core book we talked about last week. What's interesting is this is a complete divergence from the original book. Uh, the original book, single-column layout with much smaller font, which is kind of interesting to see. I got to say, I prefer this new layout. It's easier on the eyes and easier to read, and it just lays out and flows better. Overall, I found the book to be well-written, pretty easy to read, nice and clear. I didn't find anything confusing or out of place. Uh, my first read-through, I did. I will admit, took a couple of days to get through, but I could have easily just powered through it in a single afternoon. So readability is an important factor for both kids and parents in relation to this game. Yeah, my daughter borrowed this one off me and read through it and managed to fit it and finish it in one morning. So it definitely can be done. Uh, the book is broken into six chapters, uh, again, using the new PIP system rules. Uh, so six chapters using for, for the PIP system, and then there are five short sample adventures at the end of the book. Now, this is a source book for the PIP system core book, so you don't get anything like uh, what is role-playing, how to plan a session, or any of that stuff. You also don't get any rules, like the actual mechanics. The rules are not repeated here at all. So the PIP system is not explained. You're not going to, it doesn't walk you through how to make a character. It just presents the new options. It doesn't tell you how to build dice pools or how to read your white dice, or your black dice, or any of that stuff. So again, this is a huge change from the original edition, which was a standalone book with everything you need to play. Which, you know, given the system's change, it makes sense. There's no point in wasting a reader's time duplicating content when it's built on that other book completely. Yep. 
Now, taking a quick walk through each chapter, um, first you get some setting information. You got the underwater city of Atlantis, its various peoples, who the rulers are, the denizens. Uh, they talk about the dark lands, which are outside of Atlantis. They talk about the slipstream, which is this quick way to move around underwater locations, but it can be very dangerous. Um, what's neat to see here is there's actually more setting material here than was in the original Mermaid Adventures. Which you're, you're kind of hopeful for because, again, they have taken out all of those systems and rules and dice pools and character creation. So you would hope that they'd take some, at least some of that room and, and add to uh, the, the story content. Yep, there is more story content as well as other stuff. Like when we get to the new archetypes. So archetypes we talked about in the PIP system are your, basically like your character class, right? So what you hear are types of merfolk. You've got eel folk, fish folk, jelly folk, lobster folk, octo folk, ray folk, seahorse folk, shark folk, turtle folk, and urchin folk. Now these use the PIP system rules where you have, uh, you know, your physical mental health. You get a set of starting skills, one at two and two at one. You get one unique ability and one hindrance. So this is the same as all the archetypes in the other game. Now, with, again, interestingly, compared to the original, there are two new types of mermaids here. So I thought that was neat. The seahorse folk and turtle folk did not exist in the original game. Again, less system, more room. Now, no new skills are added. Skills are like your strength dex con equivalent in this. Uh, but there are a number of qualities, which are kind of like specializations. Uh, these are things that mostly make sense for an underwater fantasy setting, right? So you have like fast swimmer under athletics, uh, royalty under charm, because it's got a kind of medieval theme going on here, uh, human expert under knowledge, skill, and so on. There are also a number of new special qualities. Again, these are like special skills that are unique to characters. These include, again, setting specific stuff like Darklands Guide or the Atlantean Guard and Sense the Slipstream. Now, on the magic side of things, magic is optional in the original Pip rule book. It is required for this because magic is a big part of Mermaid Adventures. So they present two new magic traditions. Uh, there's the Sea Witch who can grant anyone any spell, but they have to give up something very important to them, which I think ties into a lot of Sea Witch fantasy we see in mermaid stories the world over. And the Sorcerer. Uh, there's also a number of new spells. Uh, many of these, though, I think would have been useful in any PIP setting. So I think if you have the PIP system core book and you want some new spells, this might be worth picking up just for that. Like you've got stuff like Beam, Hypno Eyes, which could work anywhere. But then you also have very mermaid adventure specific ones like fish form. Well, you know, it's nice that uh, because this is a generic system, you can then, you know, take these bits and pieces from your various uh, scenario books or, or your system books and backfill those into the PIP system elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem you have is with something I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a bit more later is you've got multiple books, right? You get the D and D problem of what book was that in? Uh, there are a number of new random charts in this book, new versus the PIP system book, which I, I'm almost positive I didn't compare them chart for chart, are a carryover from the original edition, which had a whole thing for rolling your eye color, your skin color, your friends, what type of fish you are, and so on. Uh, what was weird is it didn't specifically say if you roll these in addition to the charts in the PIP system book or instead of them. I'm thinking these replaced them because there was some rather odd stuff on those original charts, as we talked about in the other review. So I think it's a replacement, but it's still cool to see. You know, it sounds like the original charts could still be narratively fun, uh, but the ones in this supplement are probably more highly focused to avoid the Little Mermaid collector syndrome when you're yes. characters, right? Everyone wants their bits and bobs because, that, you know, that, that's, that's what they ended up rolling. Very true. Uh, there is a group of sample characters. Uh, this is a longer section than I would have expected. Like, these are fully flushed out art background all the mechanics worked out all the skills um 10 total pre-made characters sitting there uh it's, i i don't know this didn't exist at all in the original um in a way i guess it's good because this could get you started playing right right away or be good for like a one shot or a con game yeah so i love this because with 10 characters you can get younger players in right away and have them play multiple games with different characters True. before you have to worry about teaching them the character creation portion. Portion, uh, you're not going to get the ten, uh, you know, ten characters in one game for a no. you know beginner kids game. But if you've got two or three kids, that means you've got three or four games 
to mm-hmm. break in the rest of the system before you have to worry about character development. Yeah, very fair, very fair. Uh, then we get to the extras chapter. Uh, no new gear, which is a little surprising to me, but a whole bunch of uh, themed adversaries for the navigator. Uh, that's what they call the game guide in this um, to throw at the players. Um, you've got all the stuff you expect from mermaids, right? So you have fish and dolphins, you got pirates and bandits and uh, undead skeleton pirates. And of course there's a Kraken and a sea dragon. Um, I, again, I didn't compare one to one, but I have a feeling this is pretty much the same list as the adversary risk in the core book uh, with of course, all full rules for the core system, the PIP system rules, which are significantly more advanced for, for NPCs, for extras. Like every single one of them has three special abilities unique to that monster and they have different styles of hit points and everything. So basically I think they took the original list and just updated it. Now, as for game guide advice, again, called the navigator, there's not a lot here. Uh, Just a couple paragraphs basically explaining, look, it's mermaids. You're underwater. It's fantasy. Think Disney. Don't think reality. Uh, Don't argue about like when you talk underwater, all that would happen is bubbles like underwater fires can be a thing. Right. So I thought that was cool. More useful, though, is here are another bunch of charts, Uh, a significant number, six of them. So you roll a D6, see which chart and then 12, sorry, 11 options on each because you roll 2D6. So 2 to 12 on every chart. And these are just to spark adventure ideas in mermaid adventures and i like this a lot actually uh more than i would have thought like just hearing about it didn't sound that cool until i started reading them and like one of them is find a mystery potion all right cool and then you got your best friend wreck the family chariot i'm like oh that's cool i would have never came up with that on my own or one of you is slowly becoming a mini kraken find a way to stop this transformation before it's too late and these are just like three of the things of this multiple charts i thought this was really nice Yeah, so this is really great concept for a busy parent or a new navigator just starting out so they don't have to fumble around too much building and and, and trying to figure out adventure ideas. They can just get started. Mm -hmm. And whether it's new players or old players, it's that if that if you're that new navigator, you can get going. And then if you are the new navigator just starting off and you, or you have no time to prep, the game does end with five sample adventures. Now these, I was hoping for new ones, to be honest, but these are identical. Uh, the stories are identical to the original Mermaid Adventures, but completely updated mechanically for the new PIP system with all the detail you would expect with the PIP system compared to the basic system. Now my complaint about these, though, is they are written, every step of these adventures is written as if the characters pass the rules with no help for the navigator to pick. So for example, it might say, roll a navigation roll to find the right way to go. And it's difficult to two black dice. And that's it, that's all it says. Well, well what if they fail? What if they don't? What, what happens? Do they lose time? Do they get lost? Do bad guys attack? Right? Uh, now this is nothing an experienced GM wouldn't be able to handle, but this is a game geared at young and new players. So I gotta say that seems like a bit of an omission. Like just where's that when things go wrong paragraph? Yeah, that's definitely an odd exclusion considering how much help they've given elsewhere. Now, overall, I don't know. I I am I on the fence isn't the I don't know. I I'm not sure what to think about that. So, one thing I haven't mentioned and when we talked about the PIP system core book last week is that there's basically two sets of rules in that book. Now it's small, but you get the whole set of the rule book. And then the back of the book are these rules for playing with new players and playing for, with kids that simplify all of the different skills down to only four skills. And all qualities are just, you have it or you don't. And they provide one white tie. It's a really dead simple system. This entire book is the full PIP rules. Nothing is in these lighter rules. And I find that odd because the original Mermaid Adventures was the basis for those simple rules in the back of the PIP system core book. And it just seems like an odd choice to not present both or have this have still been the easy rules. Yeah, well, how difficult would it have been to dial down to the easier mode manually? Like, so if you were an experienced GM, um, can you can you backtrack what they've done there to that easy mode? You could do it, but like when you get to the the extra section, you'd have to be writing notes for every single one of the monsters, right? Like you'd have to go, okay, here is their, I forget, there's 14 stats. You like grab a highlighter or something and only highlight the four that matter. 
And then you'd have to decide like, okay, here's their list of seven special qualities. They're only allowed one now. What's one thing that sums up all of those? Like there, there's work right. required. Like it's not just a, a quick, simple, you only look at this part of the character sheet. Right. That might've been a good compromise. Perhaps if they had somehow a lawyer, someone had gone in and provided that extra stat block, right? That extra role. So what this means is that Mermaid Adventures Revised is no longer aimed at really young players. Like, for example, I can't see using this book the way I used the original Mermaid Adventures. This is not a game I would have presented to my preschool children to get them into role-playing. Now, on the other side, I think this book is much more interesting for older kids. And, well, how many people are introducing their preschoolers to role-playing? Most people are going to start their kids probably in their tweens and teens. And this to me seems great for tweens and teens. It's, it's much more interesting and mechanically interesting. And there's more to learn and there's more crunch. Plus, this is going to be a way better game for adults. If there are adults out there that want to play mermaids under the sea. And trust me, I know enough adult role players that would love playing in this setting. Yeah, well, I, there aren't, I don't doubt for a moment, just knowing people I do, that there are plenty of kids uh, with the ability to play the more complete system who enjoy the theme, as well as adults who would just absolutely dig jumping into this sort of a game. Uh, but that still leaves you with eliminating this youth market that seems yeah. like an obvious selling point of, that has that now been missed. I just, I, I find it odd. Um, now what I like even less though than this, uh, like the ramping up in difficulty, it, it's fine, right? Like I, your target market, how many people are playing with preschoolers? Like I said, I, I guess I get it. The thing that bothers me the most. So is the fact this is not a standalone book. I would have much preferred a full, possibly shortened explanation of the PIP system to be in this book with full character creation rules, rules for gear, rules for weapons, rules for conflicts, all of that. And in, in my opinion, should have been in this book. Now, I realize that would have made the book much thicker and obviously would have cost more, but I would much prefer that than having to flip between two books. Like having, even, even just like having all the special qualities in one spot would be nice, or a summary, maybe even provide me a summary chart that says, here's all the special qualities, the ones from the core book and this book in one place, and reference a page so at least I'm not fumbling between two books. I, maybe this is just me, but I would have much preferred a full core rule book. So car systems and supplemental books are hardly new or different no. uh, because of what this game had been, uh, you know, a beginner's easy kids friendly children's role playing game. It, it, it is an interesting shift in this particular yeah. game. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to completely bash this book. This is a solidly written RPG supplement. It's got a very cool world. It's got a great family-friendly setting. It's got all the advantages of the PIP system, including the disadvantages. Like, I know Sean's not a big fan of the dice pool system. It's got everything we talked about that's good and bad about the PIP system we talked about before. It's better laid out. It has more artwork. It has more options. It's got some great new character classes. It is a great addition to the PIP system core book, I think. But I just, I think I preferred the original book for one, being an all in one book with rules and setting, but second, for having those dead simple rules, those rules geared towards brand new and young players. Like at this point, I wish what Aloy had done is kept both books in print, possibly renaming them so they didn't look the same. Like, like I don't know, call this Mermaid Adventures Advanced, which I know, Advanced D&D, &D, whatever, or call this Pip Core Mermaid Adventures or something yep. or, or rename the other one mermaid adventures junior like i i just wish both options were still out there yeah no absolutely so for a more in-depth look at mermaid adventures revised you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews and now the bellhops tabletop where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here what games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. So speaking of events, last weekend, there was yet another online game convention. This was the Camp Capstone Virtual Gaming Con, uh, put on by Clay of Capstone Games. This hit on the 15th and the 16th of uh, this month. 
Um, this was what I'm now seeing pretty much every online con be like. It kind of followed that same format um, with a con-specific Discord server uh, with all the stuff you'd expect. Um, now, this was Capstone-specific, so it was just their games. There was a room for every game they published. There were a number of demos being done, all demos done being used at Tabletopia. Uh, it, it seems like everyone seems to be looking towards that as it's free. Uh, there were multiple chat rooms, which I like because previous cons always had like just a, a single big like hall style room. And it was nice that there were multiple, so it didn't get too loud or too busy. Uh, they did have a dealer room set up, which I appreciated because uh, they actually had prices that like good good deals, which is something we did not get at a lot of the other virtual cons. They had some really nice, like if you attended Cap Camp Capstone, you could get some good deals on uh, capstone games uh that was nice um and the other thing i greatly appreciate as a canadian is they were offering everything worldwide which is the biggest complaint i've had about some of the recent online cons is they are very u.s centric um it was nice to see this one to be a little more opened up there now i will admit i didn't actually buy anything i don't have the budget for new games right now but i was at least tempted yeah. now there were a number of panels, interviews, and game demos over the weekend. Uh, I attended some of these. They used YouTube Live for all of these, which personally I prefer Twitch. I, I don't know if that's just preference. Like, I don't know I mean, if I'm just used to Twitch or whatever it was. I found the chat a little more annoying. I miss not having my uh, my emotion emoticons. I so wanted to ding the bell. Um, the reason for that is this was all hosted by the Brawling Brothers, Josh and Brandon, which if you don't listen to their podcast and you're a board gamer, I'm kind of shocked because that is a fantastically produced uh, tabletop gaming podcast. Uh, Josh and Brandon did a great job hosting, actually. I have been a longtime fan of their show. They did a good job hosting all the different chats and moderating. Um, went really well for that aspect. Some highlights for me include checking out an uh, interview with Clay Ross. That's the owner of Capstone Games. That was pretty solid. There was a panel pipeline of development, uh, which talked about the game Pipeline. That was a huge hit for Capstone last year um, at Origins and Gen Con. And they talked about how that has now developed into a lighter game called Curious Cargo, which actually takes parts of Pipeline, the pipeline part of Pipeline, and makes it a standalone game. So that sounded really cool. Uh attended an interview with artist Ian O'Toole, which actually I really dug because this is weird, right? We talked about this with the Renegade Con, and I think I mentioned it during the Gen Con Con as well, because almost all the other artist interviews I've attended, I'm always shocked because you have these board game artists or graphic designers who do artwork for games, but don't actually play games. Uh, for example, the Miko. I love the Miko's art. He has never played any of the games he's done art for. Now, Ian was the exact opposite. Like, besides being a gamer, he thinks it's part of his job as a board game graphic designer. No, he doesn't like to be called an artist is actually using artwork to improve the games and make them more playable to him. That's part of the job. If he's contracted to do artwork for a game, he's also developing the game through the artwork. He talked about ways to do this, including one of his big things he likes to do is put tracks on the board. So instead of having, and this is a way to reduce component costs as well as table space. So instead of having to have people have piles of things, just track it on the board with one, which I'm like, brilliant. That makes total sense, actually. And talked about like how the flow of play should match how um, most people in North America read. So you should be starting at the top right or top left of the board and going left to right and down the board as things progress. It was really interesting that um, the way Ian talked about this. I'm like, that is really cool. So Mo has shrunk. Oh, now you're back. Um... Your bandwidth was low, so it shrunk you, despite everything we've ever yep. done. All right. This, this part's not going on YouTube. Anyway, yeah, exactly. Except for in the main podcast, so we're good. Uh, another panel I went to was hosted by Wheel Tapping. This is an 18xx train game podcast. And I got to say, if you were a train gamer, check out Wheel Tapping. Uh, these people know their stuff. There were, there were two. I don't know if it's always two people, but there were two hosts from the Wheel Tapping podcast. Check that out. Um, this was a whole thing where they were talking about the number of winsome games that will be coming from Capstone. So if you were excited about Irish Gage, there's more coming. So that was pretty cool. Um, the biggest one that I attended was the Brawling Brothers Bourbon Night. 
And this was a virtual version of a podcaster meetup at a con. And if you haven't gone to a podcaster meetup at a con, I'd say you're missing out, but you might want to. Um, this was surprisingly similar to the real thing. Tons and tons of people in chat, people talking over top of each other, hosts from a number of different podcasts, including the Brawling Brothers, Man vs. Meeple, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, and more. Uh, the host drinking too much and getting silly. Um, the sponsors of the show being there with Capstone and a ton of giveaways. Uh, they couldn't give away stuff fast enough. Uh, people in the chat leaving once the giveaways were done. Uh, uh, pretty much everything you expect without the crush of people or difficulty getting to the bar for a drink of your own from an actual con podcast meetup. I, I was really surprised by how much this really reminded me of going to an actual Brawling Brothers meetup. Um, interestingly, in a very cool way, I actually won a copy of Watergate, which is an 8.1, I think, on a board game geek right now. A fantastic game, supposedly, including the broken token insert. So, which means I'll never play it. But it's actually really cool that I actually won something. So that was neat. Well, and apparently, the, they were actually complaining that so many Canadians were winning things. Yes, yes, they were getting a little fried. So again, they were offering worldwide shipping, right? So I was actually the first winner of the night, which is cool. And I guess the next three people who won were Canadians. <laughs> so one of the Chris, I don't remember his last name, who was was hosting this, and is, is someone who was running the running the con he was their their i don't know what you call it co or whatever running the con was like oh stop winning canadians we can't afford <laughs> to ship to you but man were they generous like they weren't just giving away they were giving away deluxe copies of capstone of their games the deluxe box like with box inserts and upgrades i'm like man clay clay was generous i gotta say i was really impressed by that but you know what he's hosting a, a con for his fans of his company only like this is an origin this is in gen con Everyone in that room loves Capstone games. Like, talk talk about talking directly to your audience. So, you know what? I, I don't blame them. I gotta say, I'm digging these virtual cons, uh, but man, they're, they're still not real cons. Like, I miss it. I'll admit, I don't miss the big podcaster meetups. We don't go to those anymore. They're, they're a lot less fun than you think they are. Just too many people of just trying to get free stuff and no actual way to interact with the people you want to actually meet and interact with that I found. Right. All right, as for gameplays, a uh, bunch of Jaws of the Lion for us lately, working through the intro scenarios. Uh, the thing I think worth mentioning here is we have been live streaming our game, so watch our uh, Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash tabletop a lot for those. I think at this point, we're probably going to go back to our regular schedule of Friday nights. Uh, at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. We will be playing this Friday and possibly every Friday going forward. Now, as for Jaws of the Lion, Deanna and I are both really enjoying it. Um, I can't stress enough how much better the learning curve is with this box. Like, Gloomhaven beats the crap out of you when you start playing that game for the first time. Where this is, like, dive in and get, get, get play, like, scenario one and then play scenario two and learn the rules and slowly learn it, as opposed to being fed to the sharks in the original game. This has definitely been more enjoyable at the, right from the start. So uh, we did note that, again, some experienced Gloomhavers will have a little trouble unlearning some of what they know uh, through those first uh, few sets. But then, again, once you're at, you know, four or five, by, by four or five, that after you've, you know, burned through that, you know, hour and a half or two hours of your first mm -hmm. three scenarios, you're back up to, to knowing everything you're supposed to know. So. Yeah, just to, again, if you know Gloomhaven and you take a short rest in the first scenario, for one, man, you you don't know Gloomhaven very well. But <laughs> it's not going to break anything. Uh, the other gaming we got in this week is an actual role-playing game, which should be a shock to everyone who's listened to the show since day one, um, except when we weren't at a con. We, we have talked about playing games at con. So skipping cons, we played a game here at my house, sort of online um i ran a game of runaway hirelings from thomas novacell uh sean deanna and a handful of our patreon patrons uh joined us to play that game and i gotta say i think it went rather well now that is something we are going to review next week as part of the review of palooza so i'm going to save most of the thoughts uh for that next week but i will say it was quite fun though wow was that a bit of a test of my uh improv skills like that that that's that's that might be my limit right like that <laughs> that that yeah i don't think i could go any more improv than that i at least got get some prompts from the characters 
in this game there was at least some guidance uh, i think if it was any more than that it, my brain would have exploded <laughs> anything you want to say about the game sean so you know what it's a it's a fun little light story rules light storytelling system we'll, we'll delve into it more later uh very one-off but it really highlights something i've seen before in story games that's something i'm not sure how to manage and i'd love to hear some thoughts from listeners and and viewers in the comments uh about how you manage as a dm or guide in, um, when you have players who are more introverted versus more extroverted in your game so that you're really balancing your players mm -hmm. uh, activity right you don't want someone quarterbacking or, or or running simply because other players are a little shy or or just sort of you know just different different styles of gaming uh, and you really need to sort of balance that all out to make sure that everyone's having fun and some people aren't sitting there going, yeah, it was all right, but I didn't really get a chance to do anything. Uh, because that's something that can really ruin gaming for some people. Uh, and I've seen it at cons and PBTA games. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it, and I've seen some people who enjoy that too, which is another problem because you actually have to bounce that. I remember yeah. a perfect example, our Kids with Bikes games mm -hmm. game. There was one player who didn't want to get too involved in the game he wanted to be there and experience it but yep. he wasn't the, the the you know the play forward action you know keep keep involved keep the things moving keep suggesting things type of player mm -hmm. and they seem to enjoy that but i it was a struggle at that time when i thought yep. i think it was was running for us so yeah definitely i gotta say playing just through voice made that more difficult because uh, you couldn't get the visual cues, right? So you couldn't tell if someone wanted to say something. And I think there were times, I, I don't think it happened often, but I do think a couple times people got talked over and then just got quiet instead of speaking up after. I, I definitely saw that happen during our game. Whereas, you know, you get the, the you know, leaning in, the, the obviously you have something to add. And it's a little harder with as uh, the game guide, game master, storyteller, whatever. I don't even done arc. It was called the done arc in that game. I, I forgot the name of it. It was a little more difficult and, and trying to uh, share spotlight time. Right. It, it was difficult to have like same people making suggestions all the time. Yeah. With chat only, though. Yeah, it's definitely I, the next time I think I'd like to have the video on. Not to stream it or anything, but just like in Jitsi, so I can see those cues. Yeah, no, and just absolutely. Be able to like have people like you know hold up a finger or hold up something if they have something to add. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so I got stuff I need to play before the review of Palooza. So I, I need in uh, some roll for lasers, uh, some more break dancing meeples. Uh, one I'm not sure if I'm going to get to. I'm going to try is Flick Wars, which is a miniature war game that uses dexterity um that one deanna is refusing to play so i'm gonna have to convince the kids to play it so because she has no interest in miniature war gaming skirmishes or dexterity uh it's gonna be rough trying to fit it all in but you know what the kids will probably appreciate me grabbing them to play games for the next week there you go now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support Evil John, it's piling up. We owe you too many games. We need to fix that soon. Wayne Humfleet. Thanks, Wayne. Especially for Gokuku. <laughs> I was going to add that if you didn't. Roger Melange. Thanks, Roger. Zopi, thank you. And David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube every 2 a.m. on Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show where there's an unbox or unpackaging to happen. <laughs> for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.